It's the Amstel Gold Race for the women. 155.8 kilometers, the ninth edition of the race, starting in Maastricht and finishing in Berg on Terbleet. The best start list of the season, we could all agree, is right here and ready to do the racing. And this is the role of honor. Dominated by the Dutch down the years, but as the first Italian winner, Marta Cavalli, last season, Mariano Voss filled a Voss-shaped hole on the Palmares a couple of years ago. Today, it's maybe up to another Dutch legend to do the same in the shake of Annemiek van Vleuten. It's through the Dutch farm fields we'll be racing, misty, foggy, rainy fields today, and up into the hills as well, in a beautiful region in the southeast of the country, in Limburg. 155.8 kilometers then in total, starting in Maastricht, heading up following the Maas, before heading back down into the Heuvel zone, the hilly area, and these are the climbs they will take on. One large lap, and then we go on to the local laps. Four local laps. This race has an identity, and that is the Kauberg. The final climb of the race before a finish in Bergen ter Bleed after four local laps. And the superstars of world cycling lined up in the main square in Maastricht all ready to go, world champion hoping to add this to her palmares. One of the races you'd have expected her to win by the end of her career. The opportunities though running out for Annemiek van Vleuten despite her ability, certainly now in the veteran category. There's Lotte Kopecky hoping to become the first ever Belgian winner in the ninth edition of this race. Dutch champions in town as well. Jobo Vismut with a lot of pressure on them. And we were all ready to go at around 10 past 10 this morning, leaving Maastricht and heading out to what is the 12th event in the Women's World Tour in this 2023 season. <laughs> Miserable weather this morning, very cold temperatures compared to the few days leading up to the race. A little bit of light rain as well. That fine rain that soaks you through. A lot of fog around and some early action, including the best of all time, the GOAT. Mariana Foss was out there at the front. That forced everybody else to chase. Van Vleuten didn't want to see another edition pass by without the victory. And Lucinda Brand was trying to make it hard for a top Trek team as well. She then went away and took Sabrina Stoltins with her. And this is the view as we go live onto the race. And this is all that's left of the peloton. Just 20 seconds behind the two chasers, 50 kilometers remain in this ninth edition of the Amstel Gold Race for ladies. And we have a bit of an impasse behind. 22 seconds is the current gap. Growing as we speak now to 24, 25. We're on these narrow farm roads, but it's the climbs as well as the lefts, rights and problems that can cause plenty of problems for you. Inside the last 50 Ks then, I'm Rob Hatch. Welcome along, alongside me is Hannah Walker. And Hannah, this race is always exciting. And this year particularly, it's one look down at the start list and it's a who's who, isn't it? It certainly is. I think it's one of the strongest start lists that we've had all season. And when you take a look at all the, the riders, the strength and depth of some of the teams, it's not just one or two riders who could be a favorite for teams, but you've, you're highlighting four, potentially five riders across the across the board. So it's a difficult one. It always provides the excitement and the, the action that we've seen so far, um, having having followed it on uh, on Radio Tour and been seeing and hearing what's been going on. It's, it's been ever changing and so many riders ever present up towards the front. Well, just a little note about the cameras and the coverage you might or might not see today because the weather is pretty poor, as you can see. We're not getting helicopter shots at the moment because the conditions, I'm afraid, are unsafe for the helicopters to fly. So you'll be seeing things nice and close up. And this is our view of the peloton. I'm just going to see what's happening tactically because even since we came to air five minutes or so ago, the gap really has doubled and there's a bit of an impasse here going up to our next climb and this is great news for Stoltins and Brand. It's it's brilliant for them and as you say the the time gap keeps yo-yoing in and out actually and there's um, for for Movistar we've already seen that they've been really uh, attentive up towards the front because they know that they want to try and give Annemiek van Vleuten that win but it's a final edition of the Amstel Gold Race before mm. she retires at the end of the season and it's it's one of the races that at the moment is evading her palmares. Just see a little bit of a chat there between Liana Lippert 
And Pantinho just uh, on the second row there. Interesting as well, of course, Trek have got a rider up the road, so they're not really going to chase here. They're just trying to help slow this down a little bit. You'd expect that given their form this season, <laughs> as always is seemingly in the classics with Estee Works, the pressure will be on them, won't it, here? It, it, it will be, but I, I also think when you take a look at of 14 races that they've participated in this year, that they've raced, they've won 10 of them. They're... They, they know exactly what they need to do to, in order to, to be able to win this one. And we've seen it before where the gap will, will come down. And it's, it's worth pointing out as well that, that we have had a crash earlier on, which has really decimated the field. It's put a lot of the, the big, some of the big names out. Corin Lebecki has unfortunately abandoned the race. Caroline Swinkles, her teammate from Jumbo Visma, um, also one of the standout rides from Brabantsepeil, from the, uh, the team of Park Hotel Valkenburg, Margot uh, van Pachtbecker. Unfortunately, she's had to abandon as well. So Nee Fisher Black, the under 23 world champion, also has been found uh, on the back foot, having suffered from that crash too. She was actually up there in one of the early moves as well, looking really strong. And we had some blockbuster moves, including the likes of Mariana Foss up there. But yeah, maybe. Estee Works could afford to say, hang on a minute, we've won almost everything here, so we might take a back seat, and it's up to you, Movistar. We know the pressure's on you. It's, it's on those other teams, also with Team DSM. They, they also come with a, a very strong roster of riders, and it can't always be left to, to the same team, all, always to do the chasing. And I think that's also what SD Works do very well, is they, they don't overwork. They're very smart and calculated where they will do some chasing, where they will... They will, uh, they will use a rider at the front. Um, so it's it's smart. Uh, Anna van der Breggen and Danny Stam in the car for SD Works today. Doesn't get much better than that. Just a bit of experience. Just there, a little bit. In the just sports director's bit. chair and, of course, the, the former winner's chair as well. Lucinda Brand has not been on the podium here in her career, but, of course, she is a top, top rider, both on the cross field. Conditions might suit her for there today, but she might feel it's a shame they're on the road. And she, of course, is a top, top classics rider. Look at that one minute, 23 now. There's certainly nowhere near enough urgency here. It's sort of coffee ride pace here. At the we're, we're really losing that, that impetus, aren't we, from this group. You can just see the world champion, Annemiek van Vleuten, uh, towards the back as UAE team ADQ calling for the car here. And this trying to work out if this is actually the second group on the road here and and, and you can already see there there really is oh this is the front here you see Sharon van Anroy and Elise Chabé in this group interesting to see what Canyon Shram do as well today because they have various riders who can do well here as we look towards the back and uh, Olivia Baril of Canada right inside of your picture 166 on the left hand side is uh, Ali Wollaston of New Zealand who was active already in the classics this spring and she'll be, if this comes down to a, a reduced bunch sprint, and if these two are caught up front, Ali Wollaston, one to watch. Mm. Exceptional talent, fantastic on the track as well. Already uh, a World Cup winner this season on the, uh, the track in the team pursuit. And there's the rider we were talking about, the rainbow bands on the back of Anna Mick van Flutten. Interesting, only one number. Well, last edition, I think she'll take the fine, won't she, if she takes the win? <laughs> and look at this 141. The gap is growing almost exponentially now. And this needs somebody to really take the bull by the horns now because I know that there are 40-odd kilometres left. We've got quite a few climbs remaining as well. There's more climbs in this race than ever before this year. 21 climbs packed into 155 kilometres. It's the longest ever women's Amstel gold race as well. So it's getting harder and harder. And and by some uh, some kilometers as well. It's last year's edition, it was 128 and a half kilometers. This year, 155.8. So for, for the women, they also have one extra loop of this finishing loop. So they do another uh, Kauberg, Bamelberg and uh, Hulhemmerberg. Over just uh, less than 2000 meters of climbing. I mean, two minutes here, and look at how small this peloton is. This is, I mean, there aren't big numbers, really, huge numbers from teams to work together and chase this down in like a traditional fashion. You know, you could say, OK, two minutes for gap 45 k's, you put some riders on the front, but it's not working like this because the peloton's already been decimated. Everybody's tired. It's been raced full gas. 
we're going to sort of need somebody to attack on one of these climbs and pull a strong group clear if there's any chance of catching them now. At, at some point, you, teams have to start to, to discuss or maybe work a plan together and think, well, how are we going to do this? Because even in the last two kilometers, Rob, they've gained a minute. And this is, is quite extraordinary whilst they're working so well and sharing this workload between them with uh, Schulten, Zambrand, behind it's it's a it's very unusual as to how things are going at the moment and it's not like teams are isolated either and losing their their big favorites you can see the canyon stram jerseys up towards the front and they they do have strength in numbers they're they're one of the teams that uh, it seems to be that they haven't been affected from those earlier crashes at some point you've got to make a decision because leave it too late and it's going to be exceptionally difficult to bring these two back and there's there's no coming back and here we go here we go it's the human bad health team who try to light things up it's well covered of course the european champion is right on the wheel there but gonna need to commit it's got to be a, a commitment from from behind and the the thing is now as this gaps continue to go out into that 40 44 kilometers to go marker it is doable to try and bring these two back, but you've got to have that consistency in the chase and also that, that commitment. Did you see uh, Lorena Weaver, the European champion in the white jersey, just flick the elbow. CEAG Insurance, Sudal Quickstep, they're the team who are trying to bridge across here and chase along with Kenyon Stram. And this is just on the way to the Beamleberg here, by the way. Beamleberg, which will be hill number 14 of 21 today. And there are those Canyon Tram jerseys in the chase. Two minutes and four. Bran, we said a serial winner. Still Deans, by the way. Only ever won one bike race in her career back in the Basque country ooh, six years ago now. Um, she'll think that this is all that Christmas has come at once. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And in a strong position as well. And the team have had a, a relatively quiet start to the season. Um, it's perhaps not been the, the success that they might have wanted. We've seen Barbieri, who's been up there in, in a couple of the races, but for Stiltines, generally has spent her career as one of those riders who's who's been a domestique. She's been the worker, she's been the helper to help others succeed and never really quite had her own opportunity or chance. And the junction's been made by Paladin here. Now right inside, Just keep the moves. Being marked this one by uh, one of the riders from Uno X. Team from Norway. Eleanor Barker bridged across mm. with uh, Paladin here by the looks of things. She seems to be in the best road racing form of her career since she's come back from maternity. It's exceptional. The the performances that she's had, and I think back to Ken Welfelkam, it was it, it's brilliant to see that she's been able to come back and, and have that success, but also not just on the road, but having had that success on the track at the European Championships at the start of the season. To me, she was always a rider I followed who was always a track racer who did a bit of road riding. Now I would consider, a f I mean, she's here, and we just talked about it being the best start list we've seen possibly all season so far. And she's at the front of the race chasing, but not everybody can follow her though, because there are problems here for Agnieszka skaliniak Sojka of Poland. Out the back. And this is what it needed though. This is what it needed if there were Anybody to get up the road, that's Esme Piperkamp of uh, Netherlands in the black jersey at the back. Also Clara Koppenberg, this is a surprise from the rider from Kofidis in the red jersey here that she's been distanced on a, on a course where you have so much elevation, you have so much climbing that it's, uh, you can see all sorts of riders in difficulty. Also one of the riders here from but Movistar, back. this is Sierra. Mm -hmm. is Sierra for me, yeah. At the back from Movistar team and again there's gaps here. There are big gaps opening up. 136 on your picture is Urska Shigart. Racing for uh, Alula. Jaco Alula, who, of course, we only saw Shigart get back into the peloton about 10 minutes ago after that crash. Group China work together here. Also in the group is Quinty Schoons of Netherlands and Park Hotel. And now, now Movistar start to work as a team. what's needed. It's the Serbian national champion, Jelena Edic. Sprout 
out on the left hand side there. Henderson up towards the front again. What a spring she's having once more. A brilliant spring for Henderson. And it's at some point you just hope everything's going to fall into place, not just for her, but for Jumbo Visma, because whilst they've had some great results, they've had the podiums, it's they've not won a race yet. And I think when you start to get to this point in the season, you come into to the Ardennes and of course, Mariana Voss having injury, and she's only had a handful of race days herself. Um, a few bad bit of, bits of bad luck here and there with mechanicals, punctures, crashes, all uh, and the like. You just hope at some point it'll fall fall into place for them. But uh, for Henderson, it's it's a consistency that is just so mightily impressive. Now that reaction from behind has changed things. The gap has not disappeared. But it's fallen by a quarter. It was over two minutes. It's now down to a minute and a half. That was just up the beam, Leberg. You can see just with some impetus how things do change and, and how that time gap can fall when you have some uh, dedicated riders up towards the front who are doing the chasing because they know that for, for Movistar, we've already seen that Yelena Eric has been working very hard on the front and keeping things under control. And that was earlier on when we had a really dangerous move go up the road, which included Voss um, and, uh, and six others. And so she was the one who was keeping things under control. So for, for Movistar, they know what their job is. Whilst they come with strength and depth with Liana Lippitt, Florcha Mackay, the, the key thing is here is that Van Vleuten, the world champion, goes away with the win. You can just see her sitting on the wheel of the rider from Jumbo Visma, crack there. And just alongside her, Mariana Foss, as now Mackay moves up left hand side as well. A reminder that Mackay, you can see that blue jersey on the far left hand side, just hiding now behind the killer bee outfits of Jumbo Visma, <laughs> is there and ready to work for Movistar. It's going to be all hands to the pump for them, seeing if they can get another rider back on in Adelene Sierra, the Cuban. More than 40 wins in her career. Was Erich giving everything she had and might, might have been just emptying the tank there. That's the famous windmills. And we will now be heading back to Falkenberg on that big descent. And then you hit the wall. And that wall is called the Kalberg. It's been a few years since we had an addition like this, though. It is miserable out there today. The wind's blowing a little bit, not howling. I tell you, in the, the finish straight, if there is any little wind, it's sort of a, I'm not going to say it's a head wind finish, it's a head breeze finish, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is, but we, we've seen how in the past that it will pick up throughout the day. We're, around, we're talking around 13, 14 kilometers per hour, the wind here, north, north, uh, west, uh, westerly wind, but it's uh, sort of a, a head crosswind, sort of coming right onto the, the right hand shoulder the riders I think when you get over the top of the Kalberg you've got around 1.8 kilometers one long straight line that wide road Kiwi national champions jersey of Wollaston's on the front now again left hand side of your picture Henderson once more continuing to do that job helping out her leader Foss who sits two wheels behind her that's the yellow jersey on the right of your screen as you look at it now and we had the uh, World Tour leader in the centre of the picture in that purple jersey. Now back to the front, oblivious to what's happening behind. Of course, they'll know what's going on in their ears, but they're heading towards the Kalberg. 1.7 k's away from the next descent of it. So the de descent into the bottom starts here. And this is a fast road. 1 minute 22. Pull that a huge time gap there seemed like a gift at the time it certainly really was a gift because they didn't really have to work for much of the time it was given to them back of the bunch looks like this that's Nina Boseman of human powered health the Dutch rider 93 alongside her racing for the Belgian team Fenix de Koenig is uh, Juli van der Velde rider from Belgium but Belgium have a bad record here. It's not great, is it? It's not great. They're, they're yet to even podium here at the Amstel Gold. Uh, you think over the years of the riders that we, we've had with Grace Verbeko, also Yoli Dora, never been on, on the podium. And the best result is in the first edition where the Belgian, the best, the top Belgian was in eighth place. And, and they've yet to finish higher than that. But Lotte Kopecky making a debut here at the Amstel Gold race. We've already seen her in this group already. 
It's not been a race where they've uh, they've had success. Interesting that it's the AG insurance team here who are doing the work. They they know that they've got Ashley Mulman pass here. You can just see her sitting in around sixth position, sixth wheel at the moment. And again, on paper, one of the strongest riders on on this uh, on this course is Ashley Mulman Passio. When you take a look at the the punchy climbs, the climbs aren't hard per se, but it's the accumulation of all of the climbs when they come so thick and fast, and especially onto this final loop of 18 kilometres, and it's the the total elevation of the the race. There's never really that respite that you can really gain. And especially when you're constantly having to be focused, the narrow roads, you want to make sure that as the riders go towards the bottom of the Cowberg, that you're in a good position, that you're holding your position. You can try and carry as much speed as possible around that left-hand bend. You can see Anna Henderson on the front driving it for Jumbo Visma. On the left-hand side of the screen, Lorena Weavers in the European Champions jersey just coming onto the wheel of Arlena Sierra. about to turn into that big sweeping left turn at the bottom right in town in Falkenberg. A spa town on the other side of the hill from the finish. And they will head on to the famous Kalberg. Here we go. Usually armies of fans here, but with the weather, I think that people will be watching it from inside the bar. A few brave souls alongside, but here's that left turn. That's always a, a breathe-in moment, isn't it? Especially with all the white paint on the road, you never want to get that wrong. Peloton have done a great job since the last climb. They've cut a minute off the gap. It's down to 57 seconds, and it's going to be interesting to see what the picture is at the top here, because I think we might get a few attacks now. It's one of those perfect launch pads, isn't it, as you see on the, the Cowberg. Also on the right-hand side, Florcha Mackay just making an acceleration. Marina Weave is on her wheel. Rihanna Marcus, the Dutch champion, and the... Jersey there, Lee Chabé also in this group. Eddie Garcia moving up, Spanish national champion. Won that jersey again last year in a native Mallorca. Very hilly course on the day. And the casualties are accumulating further back. Antonuska Costa, the former Dutch champion now in Uno X colors. The former teammate Amber Krak there. Starting to crack towards the back, and this is now Mavi Garcia. And it's she who's moving here, which is interesting because she does have still teams up the road. It's not a full-blooded dig, is it? But she's certainly setting the pace. She is. It, it, I think it's more of one of those, keep things under control. You can see the way she's always glancing over the right-hand shoulder, just anticipating when the next move might come, that she can cover it immediately. So it's not the, the fact that she's on the front isn't because she's wanting to chase or bring back these uh, the duo up the road. She does have her teammate Sabrina Stultins there, but she just wants to make sure that she's she's got a hold on on everything. And, and last week, I, I have to say, I think they're they're probably as a team after that second place at Paris Roubaix with Katia Ragutza. I think that gives that that extra momentum, that extra motivation throughout the whole team to see. The, the wonderful, wonderful result that the Italian uh, achieved. Amanda Spratt, loose sleeves there, and that gilet certainly fastened up as most riders have it. It is not a nice day to be on the bike. Just on the right hand side as we look at it. Her teammates up the road as well, and here she is, back with Lucinda Brand. 56 seconds. So similar tactics then from Trek and Liv there at the front hand. Absolutely, absolutely. Just wanting to make sure that they're they're patrolling things, not necessarily doing the chasing, but Grace Brown, it's not the first time we've seen her make a move today. With Sarai Paladin of uh, Canyon Sram and Alenia Amilusic from behind. My team ADQ wanting to try and bridge across. Keeps climbing this, doesn't it? It's de deceptive, it's is the very Calvert. deceptive. Very deceptive. You, you take a look at the the climb, and you'd say it's uh, sort of 1.1 kilometers. But really, it's, a, it's if you take into to consideration the part over the top of the climb where it's that false flat, you're talking a, a kilometer and a half, really. And that's when the wind starts to blow as well over the uh, over the top, where it's a little bit exposed. Around 40 seconds here, the gap. Further down the road, as they come into Bergen to Bled, it's finish line time, and there will be two full laps to go after this. 
plenty more climbing to come. They might be able to see them soon on the same straight. And the gap really coming down here. Just shows how quickly things, because it looked like it was starting to get out of control a little bit. It, it was, and I think as well, it's when you start to see teams who who aren't committed to the chase. They're not keeping things going. Which teams aren't committing a rider who have got multiple riders within this group? Who is playing the waiting game? Who's playing that game of poker to think, well, someone else will chase it, and it means that we'll have the strength in numbers. And this, this race all is, is about having strength in numbers, especially towards the back end. If you can go into that finale with multiple options for the win, well, you're, you're in the prime position. They've got them under control now. They can see them just up ahead. And then... Two laps to go then. Two laps to go. And he's starting to get up a little bit more now. And the peloton having done quite a big job there in the last couple of climbs to bring back a good chunk of a two minute gap. It's thinned out again, though, hasn't it, over the Carlberg? It, it has. We've, we've can see a couple of riders. They're working well. They're not giving up. It looks like one of the riders from Trek Segafredo in that trio just behind. And large groups as well who have been distanced from this main part of the peloton. It's a 33-second gap as they go across the line with two laps to go in the ninth Amstel Golden Race Ladies' Edition. A screech of disc brakes on a wet, rainy, miserable day in the southeast of Netherlands. Limburg province with all its hurvels and hills and the technical turns into them. Farm road racing climbers were at the gateway to the Ardennes. And literally and figuratively. Wednesday will be the Flèche Wallon and next Sunday Liège, Baston de Liège. Groups off the back and continue to be so as they fight to stay in the main group there. Shirin Van Anroy, one of the riders who's been distanced on uh, on the climb. Also Balsamo, she was uh, on the wrong side of the split earlier on. You can see there the Italian champion. Not a good day for Balsamo. Also Ershka Ziegart, also in that group from Jaco Alula. So Brand and Stultins. Half a minute. One of the parts of the course that in this particular weather is going to be that little bit more nasty. We've got the usual road furniture you find in Netherlands as well. The unparked car, which unfortunately by law cannot be moved in this part of the world. It's a treacherous, mentally tough race, isn't it, the Amstel Cold Race? It is, and it's also because of the these narrow roads uh, that, that we see throughout the, the course. Positioning-wise, especially when it's that, that larger group and we've seen all sorts of difficulties for the riders. It's a race where you can never lose focus. The moment you lose focus, you're, you're losing positions in the peloton and you find yourself onto one of those narrow sections where it's, I'd say it's not even a road, it's more of a lane. And uh, as they make that left, uh, left turn onto the Fulhemmerberg. It's a very interesting house here, Rob. That's built into the uh, into the rocks. Wow! Not a bad place that the race comes past your front door, <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> you don't even have to step outside in this weather. Step in the window. <laughs> Thirty-one seconds. Then that's still Deans, the 29-year-old from Netherlands in the purple and black, and Brand, the slightly more experienced rider, also a Dutch woman in the light blue of Trek Segafredo. FDG Suez are chasing behind. This day works naturally towards the front, and then you have Canyon Sram, top, top team, and Yumbo Fisma. But look at how this has changed, Rob, already, and we're only onto the lower slopes of this climb. It's around just over one kilometer. We saw the uh, the information of the climb on the bottom of the screen and how riders are already really starting to struggle in the in the lower slopes. Marta, like the Polish champion, finding herself on the wrong side of a split. Rihanna Marcus moving up. Amanda Sprat as well of Trek Segafredo like on the right-hand side. But it's a consistent climb, this one, where you don't have real steep gradients where it ramps up and then the, the inconsistency really does the damage to riders. Kristen Faulkner of J. Lula is this on the back in the blue jersey there. It was number 131, the rider from the United States. Yeah. 
There's quite a few grimaces in this group. Cecilia Trubludvig, the Danish champion from FDG Suez. Unusual to see her already, already starting to, to feel the pace and to feel this race already. Always one of the candidates to watch here. Longo Borghini left hand side. There is Utrup. And just see, she's got that red sleeves on and black vest covering up the Danish national flag. Este works up plenty of bodies up there. Look at what they're doing to the gap on this climb. It's been a sensational performance to bring this back from the peloton so far. Well, if you think, 10 kilometers ago, it was over two minutes. And in 10 kilometers, they've brought this gap down to 12 seconds. There's no wonder there's some grimaces in that, that uh, very reduced peloton. I mean, something had to be done because it was getting to alarm bells time. Two minutes is not a gap you want to give away to anybody in the last 50 kilometers of a race. Certainly one as unpredictable as this, the left, the right. Yes, I know there's a lot of climbing that will suit a lot of people better in this group than the two out front. But they did react at the right time, but they've reacted in such a way that it's decimating this group again. And it's always a race full of fireworks, this, isn't it? It, it certainly is, Rob, and especially when you've got two riders up the road, Lucinda Brandt, who <laughs> you never really want to let off the leash too much. And then along with a strong rider like Sabrina Stultins, the amount of kilometers that she's done on the front and nice for her to get this opportunity to be out front here and, and go for the race win herself. But it's quite uh, impressive that whilst it's not been one team doing the, the work up towards the front, the way that they were very, very relaxed, very calm in letting it, it go uh, go so far. 32 and a half kilometers to go then. And we're on the penultimate lap of this year's I'm Still Cold race. Lucinda Brand continues to tap out the rhythm. She's used to this, both the classics and on the cross field. There's Sabrina Stultins just behind her, but they're about to have a lot more company now. It looks as though the whole race situation is gonna switch up again at about the same time on the course that it did last time. This is where the gap was growing. And then now five and a half kilometers from the next passage of the Bimleberg. Three hills on each lap. Just had the Hörlhemmerberg. This is now the run into the Bimleberg on these sort of farm tracks. And then we go to the Kalberg for the penultimate time. So four climbs left. Or five climbs left. Early in the day to get the maths right, Anna. <laughs> 16 seconds. With the addition of three extra climbs here, as well as just less than 30 kilometers added onto the, the distance this year, you can see the damage that's been done to, to the peloton and how it's whittled things down. My soup, somebody like Annemiek van Flirten, of course, notoriously loves a hard race. Loves, she's been the, the rider who really has been pushing the organizers to make the race longer, to <laughs> make it harder, I think. She, she really wants to make sure that each and, each and every race that she does is, is so hard that she's the only rider who can, can survive these climbs. And she's not had the best of starts to the season. We've perhaps not seen the form that we have seen in, in previous years. She hasn't had the dominance that she's been used to in, in previous years. That's really gone to Amy Vollering, Lotta Kopecky, Lorena Wiebes. But for Van Vleuten, she, we're coming into the part of the season that she thrives in, she loves as well. Yeah, two big Grand Tours to come. In fact, three of them now with the addition of the Vuelta. And of course, the date switching up slightly. Of course, on the Women's World Tour, we're gonna start with Vuelta, then go to the Giro, then go to the Tour. And then the World Championships. It's a condensed summer period. So you can maybe understand why people like Van Flirten now. Of course, in veteran status, as I said, she will be taking care of that body because you know this is the last year and she wants to get it right she she certainly does and like you say robbie it's such a condensed calendar and with with the racing coming so thick and fast it's a really hectic may calendar with so many races over in spain then a little bit of a break a pause more or less in june and then once you get to july with the giro the tour de france fam and only a week later two weeks later the world championships it's meticulous planning for for your your training uh, when to peak making sure that you're on good form and are on top of the the form as well so a lot of a lot of prepping and planning with your coaches when you're going on training camps the altitude camps 
12 seconds for Bronstaltins. And they've got them in sight. Sort of bring them back almost at will with an acceleration here. It's the only time on the course really where there's any relative rest. It's not like they're holding up here. With the plans formulated, maybe another question coming in from the car. How are you feeling? How are the legs? What's the state of play? Do we continue with plan A? Do we go with plan B? Because it's nearly decision time, 30 k's to go. You're getting to a point where teammates need to start to talk to each other. Well, how are you feeling? And it's got to be, you've got to have that trust within within the teammates. How, how are you feeling good? Or are you kind of just saying that, you know, the, the, the truth has to come out now because who, which riders are you going to work for? You can already see that Jumbo Visma are always riding well together. You can just see Amber Cracker's got herself back in, number 36, riding right next to Anna Henderson, taking care of Mariana Voss. Liana Lippert and Nanamik van Vleuten here just having a little discussion up towards the front. This is the same pattern we saw on this part of the course last time round, and this is where the gap grew to silly numbers. I, I don't feel they'll let it grow to two minutes again, but they'll just let it grow, and then there'll be a decision by one team to work, because Patino comes to the front again. She's already been dropped once. Is she now saying that, OK, I can give you a long little bit more of work before that's it? It, it? You can see them between them all, all on the radio. And I think, I mean, Van Vleuten saying, we can't let this go mm. out, because look, the time gap now, 41 seconds, just from that, that moment's lull in the pace from this group here, and just how much time they, they have gained. They know they'll be able to bring it back, but at the moment, it looks like a problem here for Rihanna Marcus. Gear issue, I think. She's spinning away there, isn't she? Oh, she's stuck in the little ring, maybe. Either that or the, the back sprockets aren't being uh, used to the full extent. She's in the easiest gear down the back. At the front, she might still be in the big ring. It's certainly not spinning the way she wants it to. It's, it's one of them where it's try and keep riding for, for as long as possible. The team car's onto this narrow road. It's going to be incredibly difficult for the team car to move up yep. and overtake through the convoy. Big ring, but the on the back it's stuck. Derelo is not budging. Stuck in the easiest gear. So Patino has gone back to work straight away for Movistar, the Colombian. And as you said, for Flirton. Maybe realizing too that she needs to use her domestics. As you've got waiting up here, Crack is waiting to try and help to see if she can bring Marcus back to the bunch. But it needs sorting the problem first. The the decision needs to be made pretty quickly. You can see Shimano neutral service. Don't try this at home. Perhaps gone into crash mode or she's bent the uh Now it's the battery on there at the back. To me, it looked as though the battery was missing there. Yep, there we go. If you look there, there's a battery missing right in the back. Moving it from the front to yep. here. Yep. They're going to uh, switch and this. That's, uh, that's not a Shimano system, so well played to the uh, Shimano neutral service there. But this is quite the repair job on the run. And I'm not sure now, on this particular part of the road, the gear might help because they're going uphill now. But it's when they get on the flat again that is the problem. Oh, it might help, he says, but of course they're racing. It's not a coffee ride, this is it. She needs more power. And that's a real problem at this stage in the race now, Hannah. A huge, huge problem, because well, this means that within Jumbo Visma, it's only Anna Henderson who is left in this group at the moment to help Mariana Voss. Whilst Amber Crack is waiting for Rihanna Marcus, you would hope at this point that there isn't any fireworks up towards the front. You'd hope that it, it remains at, at this tempo, at this pace, that, mm. that Marcus, the Dutch champion, can get back on. Yeah, Voss is on the left-hand side there, yellow jersey, and on the right, just behind Mavi Garcia, the Spanish champion. Now, you'll probably just see her come into view, yellow jersey of Anna Henderson, the helper. So, what's gonna happen here? I think she needs a team car, doesn't she? She needs a new bike. She she needs to have a bike change. And like I said before here, the, the team car's here. Now then, this needs to happen quickly. And it is a new bike. And it needs to be done very quickly. Nervous moments in the car there. 
pretty slick change, though, as quick as it could have been once you're onto that, that narrow road where the, the team car couldn't overtake any of the cars. They did it as soon as they possibly could. Schmart neutral service tried to assist, tried to help. But now the uh, get yourself through the convoy, Marcus, with crack and uh, make yourself uh, make your way back to to the peloton. Again, she has to hope that things calm down and we don't get another big acceleration here. We're on the Bemleberg for the penultimate time. Thirty-seven seconds is the gap. So it has grown again, but nothing like the crazy numbers we were seeing on the last lap. It's an extension to the adventure for Stoltins here and for Brandt. And one we probably didn't expect for a while. Sprat just monitoring things on the right hand side. You can see that Moorman is being well protected. Now then. Marcus is on her way back, and this is decent work being done by Amber Crack. She's already emptied the tank once on the Kalberg before. They're going to pass the next rider from Jaco Alula. The rider in question is Ruby Roseman Gannon. So you go back to the front now. Lippert left hand side moving up. More Mobby Star. Might. It's Canyon Shamu have taken control here. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that a rider could try and go long from the top of this climb and use this climb as a launch pad. Thinking back to 2017 when Anna Van Vloten attacked over the top of this climb and tried to go for glory. We need some move to break the resistance in that group, though. I mean, the level is the best we've ever seen, isn't it, among this group of riders? It's it's one of the, the best, and I think when you take a look down at the start list and the strength in numbers from so many of the teams, that there's so many possibilities that, that teams could have. However, we are starting to see tired legs in this group, and all it would take is a rider who is feeling good and just to break break the mold, break the group up, and all. It, if you've been working all day, as soon as you see such a strong attack go up the, up the road, it's almost head drops and you can't quite hang on at the moment, but Movistar, their intent in keeping things under control in Pantino, the rider on the front here, the Colombian, doing a sterling job. I just saw winner of the round of a fly that are not too far behind. Left-hand side there, Kopecki having the season of her life. Borghini moving up as well. Time to discard the arm warmers for Kopecki. It's time to go racing. 25 kilometers to go. Penultimate Kahlberg is next. Not happy here. Dear Not me. happy at all. Do you want a new vest there? Looking, yeah. I think she's wanting perhaps a, a dry gilet or... Not looking for the bottle, They'll probably the last time that they could take a feed at this point as well. The feeding will close with 20 kilometers to go, but not not happy. If she's radioed through to the team car, to mm. Danny Stam and Anna van der Brechen, that she wants something at the next feed. I think she says vest. And there. she wants the vest. Hearing me. Wearing that world tour leaders jersey I almost said world cup them because it reminds me of the the world cup <laughs> era the fact we have the leaders jersey yes the world tour leaders jersey is patino still tapping out that rhythm there's longo borghino i mentioned to start to position herself and it's getting hectic 45 on your picture shiren van Android. 91 not too far ahead yara castellan it's Cyclo crosses paradise out there at the minute. And as you see, everybody getting ready for action now. Ten can be said of 175 there, Minter Hurts of Netherlands, right? If the Belgian Lotto Destiny team. Well, the 
the one number on the back's catching on, isn't it? It is. I was just thinking, actually, perhaps the riders put one number on their, their outer jersey, one number on their jersey underneath, so that if they do race to the finish with a Giuliana or a Raincape, that the organisers, they know which rider's which. They don't want to be filling the UCI's coffers with the fines, do oh, they? they don't. Own enough. They don't. 24 k's to go. Hand them out like sweets. Have become uh, rather numerous in the last 18 months or so. Very strict on certain things. Well, there's Mormon pass your left hand side alongside Henderson and Foss. That's the famous landmarks again in the Limburg landscape. Shame we can't see too much of it today because it's a beautiful region. Now then, there's a vest going back. But she's having to go all the way back herself here. It's, it's very surprising. You can see that it's really upset her as well, that it's kind of rattled the cage because if you've asked for something over the race radio, I mean, I'm kind of only uh, assuming she's... It is cold outside. An and when you've been in... Uh, in these weather conditions all day. Well, she wants to put the real SD Works jersey on because I think she's thinking, well, if I'm going to win and cross the line with my arms aloft and you're into a race that is very, very important for the team with their sponsors of SD Works. They've also got uh, an office in Maastricht where they started this morning. So very, very important for this, for this Dutch team. So the New Jersey on at the back of the peloton, and the peloton catches the attackers. Braun and Stultins are brought back, and Braun now goes into domestic mode to try and work for those behind. Fernand is about three wheels behind. Also there is Sprat. We've seen Longo Borghini as well. We know that Balsam was out the game already. There's Barker just in front of Costa. And from one former Dutch champion to the current Queen of the Netherlands, Rihanna Marcus. That was the end of one adventure. And in the meantime, while these were being caught, it was the finale of the Odyssey of the rain cape and long sleeve jersey there for Lotte Kopecky. Still trying to hang on, see if she can do something again when it starts to climb. Playing an important role today for her leader from Flood. It's getting to that point now where we're heading to the road that takes us down to the Kalberg again for the penultimate time. If Patino can just have a few kilometers of recovery and respite, we can, we've seen her before. We've seen her in other races as well where she's She's done a great job, a phenomenal job, and then she just keeps coming back, keeps coming back to offer her services to the leaders. The way that she's really able to empty the tank and Van Anroy on the front now, Spratt on the wheel. There's Elisa Longobogini. She's been anonymous throughout in this group, actually, Rob. Not seen too much of Elisa Longobogini. She's kept herself hiding. She's kept herself in the wheels, kept herself out of the wind. First Italian winner of this race last year. We're going to get two from two. Marta Cavalli last time out. Grace Brown trying to get herself back on. She's wearing that uh, red helmet there. Just behind Patino on this that fast road now. One, two, two at the back of the shot, by the way. Olivia Paril. We've seen her getting back in and being dropped. Yo yoing off that back. 65 k's now down here on slippy, slidey roads into that big left-hander. And this time it's going to be more important. It's going to be incredibly important. You can see just the, the commitment from Lucinda Brand into this lower part of the uh, of the descent. She wants to make sure that she can try and deliver Shin Van Anroy, Elisa Longoborghini and Amanda Spratt into a, uh, a good position. And uh, Lorena Wiebes, the European champion, takes over from Team SD Works in the white jersey. There's Anna Henderson. She's got Mariana Voss in the wheel here. Olivia Baril. It's been a hard ride, hasn't it? It has. Discard of the jersey or zip it up. Almost like a sail. She's giving away what's for free there. Yeah. 
So then, time to move, and they are moving. Look at this. Look at the Aceste Works going to work now, Hannah. Wow. Well, this is perhaps not what we were expecting, that it would be Lorena Wiebes who would be the rider who can try and make a move on the Kauberg. And what an acceleration out of the lower corner of the Kauberg here. And look at the looking around there from Henderson, wondering if she's the only one chasing. And no real reaction from behind. Liana Lippert is there, the German champion on the left-hand side of the screen. She's being tracked by Cecilia Chubb Ludwig at the moment. Dami Vollering just patrolling for her teammate Vibers, and this is onto the steep section here. This is where the gradients reach 12%, 13.5% uh, on the Kauberg. So Vibers at the front, and they go out the back. Goodbye to Lucinda Brand, also going with her. Her mate from the breakaway still teams. Of course, Vibers last victorious at the Scalda Press the other week on the podium in Dupana and in the Noko de Cursa. The last time she raced in the Netherlands, she won. It's a big ask on this park over her, but she's done a great job for the team. A terrific job, and not just for trying to split things there in the cowboy, but perhaps trying to, to force riders to go early and use it as a, a lower launch pad and use their legs, but also the work that she's done on the front in keeping things under control, looking after Kopecky in the group, looking after Damie Vollering. She's had a, a stellar start to the season with Team SD Works already. They clap them up the Kalberg. They'll return once more before the grand finale. For now, though, it's just pain for Nina Boisman and those chasing on behind. Rachel Nalen, the veteran in uh, the red jersey from Kofidis. Not panicking when she starts to get distance on this climb, just riding well within herself there. Stalemate at the front again now. From Flirton, though, very much visible. Takes a drink. For her, you feel something happens, has to happen over the next lap. Is it going to be waiting till the Kalberg, or will she want to go earlier? She should be fueling up for an effort. Everybody thinking the same thing now as we go back into the final 20 kilometers. They know that the action is going to, to start at some point, and Kristen Faulkner, she is the first rider to start things over the top of the Kalberg here. Off she goes to front. He's already back of Strade Bianchi. She wants to put a right to that. What heartbreak for the American. Off the front again here and attacking. She is so strong. This is where she belongs in a bike race. An animator, an aggressive rider, pure power. And still so new to the sport. It's quite incredible the way that she's risen through the professional ranks and having only uh, turned professional um, during sort of the lockdown period 2020, 2021, where we saw her have some exceptional performances in some of the spring classics. And for Faulkner, it's just she's just gone from strength to strength. And this is a dangerous move because give her five, ten meters. She'll start to double that and she'll ride away. And you don't at this point, given her strength, given her ability and capabilities, and for these riders knowing what she's capable of to go on these long range attacks and on terrain that really suits her down to the ground, this could be a dangerous one because she doesn't go away with such power like we saw with Lenny Weavers making an attack. It's almost this stealth move where she she gradually gained the time and everybody behind starts to look at each other thinking well who's going to do the chasing but it is fdj it's grace brown who senses the danger here Rebus is in this group as well costas there as well it's an interesting group and out the front by the way faulkner only returned to racing for the first time in just over a month actually since that period in italy uh with a top 20 at the brabots of pales that wasn't a bad result for the 30 year old for the united states already a two-time stage winner in the Giro d'Italia. The bell will ring this time they come through. It'll be the start of the final lap. And it's going to be a narrow gap for Kristen Fockman. Nothing of any note yet. That's because there's a concerted chase here. And it's Vivas who's done a fantastic few kilometers. 
Behind there goes the reaction. It's only a nine second gap here for Faulkner. She needs more than that. Last lap then in the upstall goal race. So Faulkner being chased with the housing estate that's behind the finish line here and then into a very, very fast road downhill straight into our next climb, which is the Hallimerberg. Fast, tricky descent into the low slopes of that climb as well. Change in road surface as well, where you've got the bike paths either side, so it's, it's narrowing the actual uh, lane where you have the asphalt, the tarmac. Those little clinkers, the little red clinkers on the road through the feed zone for what I would say is the, the final time now. Final chance if you want to try and add a little bit of fuel to the body. Last minute rehydration. So leaving Berg and heading down to the Perlemel Berg. And Wallace just hanging on at the back there, see if she can be any use to her team. This they get up the next climb without too much happening, then she could be on that flat section, but something tells me that somebody might want to go on this next climb as well. It's just that gap of around five and a half, six k's to the next climb there isn't after this one. Sixteen and a half k's to go, the next couple will tick by quickly. And then it's straight into the climb here. Straight uphill, Faulkner hasn't lasted too long in front here, and Vibas is doing quite the job. That's the end of the descent, but it's soon time to go uphill. If Deji also in the chase, and it's really strong out and breaking up. Interesting to see what sort of shape the bunch is in, if there is a big bunch at the top here. This gap starting to open up because of that descent there. You saw Cecilia Trubludvig just a, a few bike lengths behind this uh, select group that's starting to form here at the front. There's a lot of riders who were taking that descent very gingerly. Julie van der Velde of the, the team of Fenix de Koenig, who was taking that descent very gingerly indeed. Now the move behind from Canyon Strap. Being followed by Fernand Roy. By the way, on the right-hand side, it looks like it might well be, if not day done, certainly climb done for the minute for Vibus. And Faulkner yet again has company in a different shape. And it's Fernand Roy left inside. Another movement from out the bunch. It looks as though Canyon are being quite active on this climb. Very active. And they've always got riders up towards the front, but also never too far away now. And being very vocal there up the front, Lotta Kopecky. The way that she's calling the shots of where she wants to be on the road, calling the shots to Lorena Vibis of what she wants her to do, and quite the job done from the European champion here. Everyone was very concerned and, and discussing things. How would it work that one of the, the best sprinters, or if not the best sprinter in the world, how that dynamic would work within SD Works, or with their, given their success, given the fact that they're so dominant across the board in so many different races, but she slotted herself right in, and you can see she's very committed also to pay, play that team that team card also. Perfectly, perfectly so. Not something we've always seen in that team since the start of the year, certainly on Italian soil in the first race of the season. Provided some discussions as well, didn't it? Oh, it certainly did. Made our jobs easier for a week or two. <laughs> Now then, first little bit of a pause here, but the next move's going to come. Certainly positioning anyway, there was maybe no way through towards the top there for the rider from Canyon Sram. This is where the grading gets easy on this climb. Goes over the top towards the right here, and out onto the farm roads again. Barker finding herself distance here for Unoex in the yellow and red jersey. Also there is Anna Henderson of Jumbo Visma. Number 35 just out of the saddle. Likewise with Femke Geritze of Park Hotel Valkenburg 151. And it looks like Alex Manley of Jaco Alula, who's also been distanced here. If she can claw her way back to this group, she'll be a dangerous one to watch for the sprint finish because 
she, once she gets, say, almost a sniff of the finish line, if she can get herself to the Kauberg, she's got a real turn of speed. Paladin then, who tried to get to the front at the top of that climb there, but sort of passes to the front by the national champion of Netherlands, has managed to do it. This looks like it might be Fernand Broy now in the chase. It is Soraya Paladin of Italy, though, there for Canyon Tram. 15 kilometers to go in the Armstrong Gold Race. Again, Paladin just making this harder. She has a couple of teammates still in the chase, and Fernando now attacks this as if she were attacking one of those muddy climbs in a field over the winter. She's with great gusto. Faulkner's still a factor here at the front. Just in the Persicos hanging around there as well. Remember a winner of the Brabot of Pale on Wednesday. Wants to try and get the better of the rest again. And what a, a victory that was for her in out sprinting Damy Vollering. The confidence that that must have given to Persico was, would be next level. And also within the whole team, as we see a move from Elise Chabé. Well, they're starting to hit them with the punches now. We've seen a few left jabs, not quite the right hook yet from Canyon Shram, but they're starting to land those punches. Shabby, the next rider to go. And they want to make this as hard a finale as possible. And they know that they can. The wind is coming onto the right-hand shoulder of the riders here. There's a few exposed pieces of road, and if they can really get a hold of this, as you start to see a few gaps open, Damy Vollering being the rider who's chasing things. For Vlurt, just on her wheel. She's very hidden on the wheel of uh, Persico here. She is. And now and she, she moves. Out. Now she moves. Anna Mick van Flutten, where you least expected her. Not waiting for the climbs, wanting to use shock and awe, surprise. And here she goes. Always an entertainer. Anna Mick van Flutten is after the one big prize that eludes her. Her home world tour race in the Netherlands. Missing from a Palmares in her last year. And with 13 and a half kilometers to go, is trying to grab it. And she's brought a good group of riders clear. A very good group of riders. And you can see that, that road there, just how it descended and traversed its way through this field and through the countryside here. Things all come back together. And the next move's going to come from Canyon's Tram. So we have indications that even the very best riders do not necessarily want to wait for the Kalberg. And again, it's Van Amroy trying to close. Is she struggling, though? A look behind there. She shows it closed one gap. And that's it. It's that strength in numbers you were talking about with Canyon Shram. Van Flutten's already had one dig. Again, it surprises when it came. And she's in the chase again here, about fifth wheel behind Faulkner, who remains active. Perhaps for Van Vleuten wanting to try and make a almost a, a precursor to the big attack. Just wants to try and open the legs up, open the lungs up before she really wants to try try and put a big dig in and a lot of these moves that are trying to go off the front now they're immediately closed down and i think the the weather conditions the wind perhaps not uh, quite into to the favor and also not the commitment there from all of the riders at the moment perhaps a few too many riders within this group Twelve kilometers remain shooting for on roy at the front Trek Sigafrida, one of the teams of the spring yet again. Bobby Star looking around and Van Flutten still has the lip behind her. We just saw that um, Makai was getting dropped last time. And that's the Estelle Works numbers that come into play. Mischa Bredewold. And they will have to chase. Not necessarily on the name, but on the jersey. Whenever a rider from Team ST Works goes up the road, it's always going to be a threat. It's always going to be a danger. And for Mishka Bredewald, well, we've seen this in the past, even when she was with the smaller continental teams, that she's always one of those riders who isn't afraid to attack. She's an opportunistic rider who knows that she can pick her moment right, and when she does, it can pay off. I'm looking behind. Back in one of the many groups on the road now. She's used to winning in this region as well. Won the Volta Limburg Classic only a few weeks ago. 
First victory of the season for the rider from SD Works. Comes from Amersfoort. Reel back in there. And I think that'll be that for this move. But again, if you're at the back of the peloton and having to make these extra efforts, it isn't going to help your chances when it comes to the hillier stuff. And a reminder that there are two hills still to go. One more passage of the Bemleberg and then the mighty Kalberg before the run into Berg at the finish line. A lot of Berg in that, I know, but a lot of Bergs around here. <laughs> it's that type of geography. There's Mavi Garcia. We haven't really seen her put in a big dig yet. And where's her form? Not quite as hot as she normally is at this time of year yet. But again, with Van Flirten as well, we mentioned that the, the calendar is slightly different this year. And another Grand Tour to add in the mix as well. And with them coming in such close proximity for, for Mavi Garcia, she knows that you take a look at the stages at the Tour de France Femme Effect Swift and you, you think to that uh, penultimate stage, she must have her eyes glued to, to some of those stages and for for live racing uh, tech find, it's perhaps been a, a slower start to the season that they might have wanted, but it's building nicely. She's got a teammate in this group as well in Caroline Anderson, the Swedish rider. So she does have, you can just see her there in that purple jersey on the wheel of the Spanish champion. We're number 73. Now on our way up towards the village of Bemelen. And from there we head to the Bemelenberg. A few hundred meters to hit the village. This is where the road starts to go up, not the start of the climb proper yet. Got to get to the older Akustrat for that to happen. More riders getting back in on the back. There's uh, Barker. Florcha Mackay and Alex Manley get themselves back on, as well as Julie van der Velde of Fenix de Koenig. It's been quite the performance from van der Velde. She's been dropped more times than I think I've seen anybody get dropped recently, and each time she's come back. Now then. They're coming back to the front again, another move, and a real increase in pace. Canyon Tram, the most active of the teams. Now then. We we're just talking about them, weren't we? And they're on the attack here. And is there going to be a reaction? There is, or there was. It shows just how much that Canyon Sram are all over these moves because you had three riders about to make the chase here and about to do the chasing. It's Baufein, the German rider, who is doing the chasing for Canyon Sram, and Mariana Voss has got herself into that move there. And look the who that drags out. Look who that drags out. Aramik von Flutten is going to not want to let Mariana Voss ruin her dreams of a big Amstel Gold race win. She's not looking good to me, Annemiek van Vleuten. Every time she gets out of the saddle, the drop of the head, the drop of the shoulders, it's almost that labored acceleration when she's out of the saddle. It doesn't look comfortable. It's not looking like the van Vleuten that we've seen before. Do you think, as the expert you are, van Vleuten would have attacked there if she was feeling good? She certainly would have tried to make a dig, and the way that she made that look difficult just to close five, ten meters to the wheel of Mariana Voss there, it doesn't tell you that she looks good, she feels good. You can see the facial expression that something's not quite right, but that she must be confident because it's been her team all day who, who have been doing the riding, who've been doing the controlling. She's had such a brilliant work done from from Paola Patino, also Elena Sierra, Yelena Erich. On to the Bemelberg then, 900 metres long, a 4.9% average, maximum of 7.4%. The fireworks go again, Tom is caught back, and look who's chasing, because Annemiek van Vlutten this time is down in the drop, she's swinging from side to side. She doesn't seem to have that punch to close the gap quickly though. It's, she's making this acceleration and she looks good there, but then it's that immediate stall in the acceleration she does five six seven uh, pedal revs and then just can't quite match it and, and look at this now she's she started to be distant she started to fall back Marta like doing the chasing from Sarah Tiz at WNT the former Polish champion but Paladin taking a look around on this hairpin second attack in the last five kilometers from Soraya Paladin she attacked on the top of the last climb she's gone from the bottom of the beam bed and she is one of the riders tasked with making it hard for Canyon Tram. Eight and a half kilometers to go. We're just over halfway up the Bimla Berg here. Again, looking back to see the reaction. 
There's some tired, tired legs out there. Let's not forget that the weather will have made things a lot worse. The camera angle, I think, foreshortening this, the gap around seven seconds for Paladin. Again, what's left in the tank for her, given the attack that she put in before as well. It's been a really hard attritional race. Flirt and sitting back in the back again. It's not over for her, but she's certainly not looked the same sort of dominance, dominant rider. She tried to follow this, and it was a big effort to try and follow this. She just could not, though. You can see at this point that you were thinking, well, actually, perhaps she's she's got the poker face on she's, she's almost calling the bluff and look away at the way she's sitting in in the peloton at the moment the how much ground that she's lost since making that acceleration this is not normal this is not normal for us to see van vleuten in this in this position here and not able to to close the gap or even bridge across to paladin here there's another move gone off the front there it's a rider from fdg paladin here in the multicolored kit of the German team, Canyon Schramm. It's their Italian rider who's at the front. Grace Brown once again trying to get herself off of the uh, the front of the peloton at the moment for FDG. They've already had success in this race one year ago with Marta Cavalli, the Italian. But Brown, ever the opportunistic rider. Paladin. 29 now, rider from Treviso in the Veneto. Yet to win a ride, a race since before the pandemic. And Este works playing the card of Bredevold again. And now another move on the left hand side from Annemiek van Vleuten. And it's Van Amroy's in the chase. Now van Vleuten waiting towards the top of the Beermelerk. And again, sits up. It is not the Van Flirten we're used to seeing, is it? There's that pause. There's just something not quite there. Seven Ks to go. And if Van Flirten does manage to pull this off, it will be certainly one of her more labored wins. There's a lot of competition here. Paladin riding well. Again, that last victory of hers. Seven victories in her career coming before the pandemic in 2019. She had a top five in Binda, top ten in the Omlop at Nusplad, top ten on Wednesday in uh, Brabant Pale as well. So she has the form. And under the new sports director, good mate Magnus Beckstedt, looks to be refining it. Four Ks to the final climb, but it's still difficult road over here. Brown has been in there and not quite managed to get across. Trying to make inroads. Paladin looking around, hoping that perhaps one rider will come across. She's hoping and praying that perhaps Brown could come across and just give her a moment of, of respite, just give her a, re a wheel to sit on, especially before they make that fast run in down to the bottom of the Cowberg, before they make that left-hand turn, because we've seen already just how fast that is for the teams, and especially those teams who've got strength in numbers. The sheer pace going down that descent, 65, 70 kilometers per hour, Reminded that Kasia Nivia Doma can sit nicely in the bunch. Not had to show her face in the wind. Last little bit of climbing up to the top before the road starts to go downhill towards Karlberg. Brown looks like she might just get across, but again, it is laboured, it's difficult. And once more, I think we're seeing how hard and how difficult this race has been on the legs today incredibly arduous throughout this this new course having that extra part of the course up to Sittard, the extra just less than 30 kilometers added on to the race another loop of the this 18 kilometer circuit another climb of the Hulhemerberg, another climb of the Bemelberg, and another ascent of the Kauberg. you can see just how labored the riders are and that there's plenty of tired legs and once we get to that final ascent it's who's got something left. It's where the riders can really make and force a select group here. Grace Brown makes contact with Soraya Paladin, the Australian with the Italian. 
FDG Suez, defending champions, of course, but that winner from last year has been out the back for a long time now. Not involved in the final part of this race, Marta Cavalli, this year. Grace Brown doing her best to make sure she's there. Reminder that Brown still has Utrup in this group behind. Panadin still has several riders in there, including Kashani Viadoma, who's been up there in this race before, let's not forget. 2019, amazing, dramatic win for Nivia Doma. There's Mavi Garcia still waiting as well. Coming to decision time, though. It almost doesn't feel like it, does it? It, it doesn't. It's, it's been a very slow burn to this point in the race, really, because when you can see two extremely strong riders up the road at the moment, and especially the fact that three of the riders within that group are from Canyon Sram, they're not going to be doing any chasing. And when you've got Grace Brown, who when she gets into this type of, of position in a race, she is committed. She's not looking back. She wants to take that opportunity. You look back to uh, Three Dex Panna a few years ago. It's one of the sprinters' classics, the sprinters' world championships. It's always been a sprint. Grace Brown, she got that script, she ripped it up, and she won solo. So it's not beyond realms of possibility that these two can go to the line if everybody starts looking behind and looking around to other teams, other riders doing the chasing behind. The Kalberg, though, could be a great leveler. You can feel great here down the hill. And once you hit the wall, the form can hit the wall with it. 11 seconds, 3.9 k's to go. It's brown here in the blue, red, white, and black. And in the multicolored jersey behind, it's Paladin. Good race, whatever happens here for Paladin. She's ridden well today. She's got teammates here behind. Matalak on the right side. She was so close to. Riding for glory last week, maybe did a little too much in the velodrome, you thought, looking back, but again, it's hard not to get excited when you're in that position. It certainly is, certainly is, especially with such a huge, momentous race like Paddy de Roubaix, but hopefully it's one of those races where you look back and you think, oh, I could have done this differently, I could have done that, and, and it's all of that learning process afterwards and the feedback from the coaches, the sports directors. I would have said with Jackson in that group, she was the strongest and one of the fastest as well. It's uh, almost a, a lost opportunity for the former Polish champion, but here she can perhaps redeem herself because she can climb well, but take her to the finish and she can sprint well as well. She got her first World Tour victory last year in the Tour of Romandy, one of the final races of the season. Last left turn then into the big wall. They cheer as they hit the Kalberg. Two leaders in the ninth edition of the Amstel Gold Race. Grace Brown here at the front for FDG. Just behind her is Soraya Paladin. 1.2 kilometers, all uphill. And then it's the nervy ride to the finish for the last K. Behind, they're not too far behind. And there are opportunities here to swallow that gap up in an instant. If you have the legs and power, the question is, who has the... Paladin is having a go again here. And she's putting Brown in trouble. This is a super ride from Soraya Paladin. And behind we wait for a reaction. The Italian fans having some fun though and else to slow down. But that's not going to happen. Onto the steep gradients here of 12, 13%. And Grace Brown, she's really starting to feel that. She's out of the saddle trying to get everything else out of her body, trying to make an acceleration, but Paladin is just too strong for the Australian here. And coming from behind, Rihanna Marcus, she's got Ashley Mormon Patio on the wheel. Patio is there, Lippert is there, not far behind as well, the German national champion. Paladin still remains, she'll be wishing that this race still finished at the top of the hill here, but they're making ground on her. Dutch champions right up there for Jumbo Visma. She's had issues today as Marcus, but she's about to get back in the game. A brave ride from Paladin, but the power's over. It's now Lippert, it's now Marcus. Then you have Moulman Passio. You can see that Nuvia Doma's not far behind, and Lotta Kopecki still in the fight. With Greta teeth, Katia Nuvia Doma, she knows that Paladin is just about to be caught. She's been in this position before Nuvia Doma, where she took the victory in 2019, and the world champion, she's in all sorts of difficulty. It's not to be in the final appearance in the Amstel Gold Race. A big hole in her palmares. One of the races she would have wished she'd have won, 
Well, I'm afraid for Anamik from Flirton fans, unless there's a big turnaround here, it's not going to happen. One rider just latching onto the back of this group here. I think that's Fife for Georgie of Team DSM in the black jersey. And Paladine, if she can hang on, there's there's Fife for Georgie. There's Fife for Georgie in the oh. black jersey. And what a and spring she's having, but we're going to have a move. What a spring that Fife for Georgie's having. And now Este Works are going to play their cards because we know that Kopecky's in this group. It's time for them to attack. It's time for them to go again and make everyone else chase. And this is perfect here that Damie Vollering has made this attack. Liana Lippitt, she's doing the work at the moment in trying to close the gap. She's looking for some assistance. She's uh, sh looking around. She's flipped the elbow. Cassia Nuviodama, is she going to come through and do the chasing? She is. Damie Vollering, second in the past two editions of this race. Will it be third time lucky for the Dutch woman? There were question marks about the teamwork at Strade Bianchi, but here they're working to perfection and in unison. Because if it comes behind, you know there's only one favourite, and that's Lotte Kopecky in this group. For now, though, Este works have plan A, plan B, and they're working perfectly in synchronisation. This is... This is perfect for SD Works because the forces Mulman Passio, Marcus, Cassia Nuviodoma and Lippert to do the chasing and it means that Kapeki can sit here, wait, wait and wait. And at this point, for Mulman Passio, she's one of the slowest riders from this group. Make your move, try and bridge across, try and counter-attack here. But this is it. Unless something happens now, following is going to take the win. It's going over the top, she has 800 metres to ride and she has quite the gap. This is Demi following riding to victory. Second two years ago, second last year as well. And Demi following now is going to move up to the top step of the podium. And if she does it, it's only her and Philippe Gilbert who've been able to win Strada Bianchi and Amstel Gold Race in the same season. She wants that top step. You can see how disappointed she is when she doesn't take that victory, when she comes so close. And Rihanna Marcus, she's leaving it late, but can she bring back the Dutch woman? Demi Vollering riding away. Marcus is doing her best to chase. And Kopecky behind will be thinking about the other step on the podium. Vollering looks behind, she knows it's hers. Time to get it ready to celebrate. 100 metres to ride now. All smiles, and again, it's Dutch dominance at their biggest one-day race. The Amstel Gold race, after two years of playing second fiddle, finally goes to Demi Follering. Este works to it yet again. And in behind, they will win the sprint for second place as well, or at least they'll be on the podium, because Kopecky was up there in either second or third. And they finished together previously, not wondering quite what's happened. This time, though, they certainly knew how they were playing it, Adam. What's that? Their fifth one-two of the season, perhaps, for SD Works. Wow. We've seen a few Mape tribute bands this year with Yombo Visma and the men's peloton, but SD Works, well, there'll be a few photos up in that office you mentioned just down the road in Maastricht. This will be another one. A huge, huge moment uh, for, for SD Works. And, and what a way they've played this race, the way that they've ridden. They've been so calm, they've been so patient. They've not been the team to do all the chasing and to, they've always sat back, almost keeping themselves anonymous, thinking, well, no, we're fine. We're fine with this breakaway up the road, forcing Movistar, forcing the other teams to do the chasing. And this is it. You could just see that move from the back. Nobody even looking at this point. And by the time that Lippert looks over, there's a gap. And it's where they fail to close it there. And there's just no cohesion behind. There's, there's no cohesion. Liana Lippert, she was straight onto the move, but she'd already done so much work on the top part of the Kalberg. She didn't have the legs left at that point. She was almost wanting, needing, willing another rider just to come through and give her that wheel to sit on, just to have some respite, some recovery. And if you don't have that cohesion immediately with a move like that from Vollering, well, it's going to be mightily difficult to bring it back. And they, she's never to be seen again. Well, she'll deserve that one. Two times a near miss. This time, she takes victory. And Demi Follering is becoming a bit of an Amstel Gold legend. And the celebrations can begin. It will mean a lot. And then already three victories this season for following. 
They work so well together. Yeah. And I think uh, that Lotte Kopecky becomes the first ever Belgian on the podium. It's great for them. It's great. And for, for Belgian cycling, it's just going from strength to strength. And this is what we, we've needed and what, what they've needed, that Belgian fans and the, the public have needed, that they've had this this role model that they can follow in hey, previous Lotte. years. We've had Jolene Dora, but now with, with Kopecky and the victories that she's having and the way that she's able to win. It's it's quite something magical. It's nice to see these two with the camaraderie as well, because you know, after Flanders, after the, the talks of Strada Bianca, I think we can put that all to bed now. I certainly wondered how they were getting on. And we've been given a resounding positive answer there. They'll cycle off to the podium. And there'll be a pincher. Nice little fresh beer awaiting for them. Sharon Van Anroy, by the way, was the other rider on the podium, which is quite a tremendous performance, given how much work she did and how much attacking she did. Very, very impressive. And it, the, the amount of times that she was distanced, having to find herself, chasing back on, caught behind the crashes for Van Anroy. The work that she's done, it was it's quite surprising, actually, because we saw Aliza Longoborghini, who was keeping herself very anonymous, keeping her powder dry within that group. And in the end, it's the young Dutch woman rounding out the podium in third place. Almost a disbelief for Damie Vollering at this victory here in Amstel Gold. And must be a relief, Rob, for, for Damie Vollering. The times that she's tried, second coming so close. This was the second group on the road that was uh, sprinting for the minor placing. Cedric Kerbal on the right-hand side. Mariana Voss in the yellow, just down the center of the road. Over in groups, as they watch from the terraces here in this yearly stadium that's put together at the Amstel Corn Race. And it's quite the afternoon. Let's just have chapter one. Well, we saw some fans back at this race last year, Rob. There's a few people in VIP, but I feel like we're really back to it now. Everyone thriving and enjoying the racing. Back at roadside. Well, a reminder that the men's race still to come. I can tell you that, that was underway at a very similar time to the women getting underway this morning. We have just seen a, a really tough race. And here's the... Demi Vollering, finally you did it. Your maiden victory in the Amstel Gold race. How does it feel? Oh, amazing. Whew. I can quite not believe it yet, I think. This was the plan and, uh, yeah, we executed it again so good. And I know... Um, yeah, I wanted to attack on top of the Kouberg and I saw like that a lot of riders were already finished there. So I thought, okay, this is perfect for us. And I saw Lotte was super good still and she looked behind. Like if I gave the sign uh, to go and then, uh, yeah, I said, yes, I go. <laughs> Choose the right moment. You, you have chosen the right way. And then it was full gas. Talk us to those, to the last kilometer. Ah, painful. I didn't dare to, to look behind and uh, I just was thinking, okay, go as fast as I can, and uh, probably they will doubt a little bit behind, so then they will never get me back anymore because I, I knew that the what's what I was riding that they uh, that they could not uh, get me back anymore. How difficult and hard was it today with the fog, with the rain, and uh, etc. Yeah, it was it was a hard race. Uh, it was really cold, and uh, yeah, I mean. I like cold weather, so I kept it all day in my mind that uh, it's good for me, for me and uh, yeah, um, it was good. It was a hard race, so I liked it. What made the difference today with those previous editions when you were second? That's a bit harder, maybe. Uh, that suits me also. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I was already two years so close um, and I always trusted my sprint. Um, but now that uh, how it happened last year, I got a bit inspired and also with Lotte, I had Lotte now in the group, so I knew, okay, now I 
can really go for the attack and if it's not working out then Lotte can still win the sprint or the other way around if I did not super feel super good on top of the Kauberg but I felt good so then I could try it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Demi Follering finally wins the Amstel Gold Race after twice coming as close as you can get without taking that top step. It's a 1-2 with Lotte Kopecki, her teammate, finishing in second. The first ever Belgian woman on the podium at the Amstel Gold Race. Shinin van Amroy in third. Another top five for Nivia Doma. She's always there or thereabouts in this race with another good positioning from Paladin. It's two riders in the top five for Canyon Shamu Road. A strong race. Grace Brown, top Australian there, is sixth. British rider, five for Georgie, who's had quite a spring in seventh. Ashley Moomin Passier, always consistently South African star. There's Silvia Persico, winner on Wednesday, top 10 again here, and Cecilia Lutrup Ludwig in 10th place. It's uh, a who's who in the top 10 as well, isn't it? A brilliant top 10. Uh, there's a, a lot of tired legs out there today, Rob, and you can see that the way there was no reaction to the move here from Vollering, where the Moulman Passio was just alongside Vollering at that point. It was only that moment where Pfeiffer Georgie was just getting herself into this group, so she was probably thinking, I've just got back to this group, and now a move already is going up the road. But for, for Liana Lippitt, she tried, she tried to bring this back. She wanted some assistance and the, the head there just falling for Cassia Nuviodoma. Just didn't quite any, have anything left in the tank to be able to bridge across and bring this one back. For Vollering, once she had the bit between her teeth and once she was in full flight at this point, on that false flat with uh, just over a kilometer.
Oh, finally the helicopter up. Might be very good news for what we're about to see this afternoon. I can say the men's race has been rattling along, rather like the women's race as well. We'll be coming to it. For those of you staying with us, in just a few moments' time. Stage preparation ahead of the podium presentation. All behind the scenes of what the riders have to do and the different protocols, interviews, speak with the press, and that's one happy team owner there. Erwin Janssen with Lotte Kopecki. What a day for the team of SD Works. <laughs> well, it's not a bad debut for Lotte Kopecki here at the Amstel Gold Race, already finishing second place. There's Belgian on the podium. The best previous result for any Belgian woman was eighth place. That was in the inaugural edition back in 2001. Soon the podium should take place. <laughs> and there's Flo. There's the dog of Demi Vollering. Fresh bibs, fresh jersey on for the podium and uh, muddy paws to boot. Well, this is the scenes at the top on the finish line in Bergen to Blyde. Plenty of fans trying to get themselves into a good position so they can have a good view of that podium and see the podium celebrations.
Een geweldig applaus voor Sirin van Anrooy. De plaats dan gaat naar Sirin van Anrooy. A very happy Sydney van Anroy in our home region. And then the first ever Belgian rider on the podium of the Ladies Amstel Gold Race is Lotte Kopecki. And she's going to have a mate up there with her, not for the first time this season. This time they're going to be all smiles. And certainly for the riders who have to stand on the top step. Because she's tried a few times to win this thing. And Demi Follering, after two years finishing second, now is on the top step. The sixth Dutch win here in nine races. And Demi Follering is the winner of the Amstel Cold Race. Element of mystery to it as well. The prize appearing out of nowhere. I saw that for the first time last week at Paris Roubaix. It seems it's caught on. It's quite something <laughs> prestigious. It's not quite a cobblestone, but it's uh, a terrific trophy. I know it's cloudy, but they didn't need to add any more, did they, today? It's Excuse almost me. like out, out of the smoke, it stars in your eyes. <laughs> well, tonight Demi Follering will celebrate as the winner. It's following Kopecki van Anroy. The podium at the end of this year's Amstel Gold Race. And here's the reward. The Thirsty real, work. The real race is on. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure they'll all drink to that. She's thinking, she's drinking this Dutch beer as a Belgian. I was going to say. <laughs> It's the Amstel Gold Race, the 57th edition of the race that starts in Maastricht and finishes just up the road in Berg. It's one of the biggest days on the cycling calendar and the best one-day race in the Netherlands. Hello and a very warm welcome to live coverage. It's a cloudy, misty, foggy day here in the southeast of the country, but we're ready to head up into its hills, the lefts, rights, the complicated nature of the route, always one that entertains and sometimes it surprises.
This is the view down at the finish straight, and these are the riders who have won it in the last decade. Mikhail Kwiatkowski, for the second time in a decade, was the winner 12 months ago. Wat van Aert, the year before that, two very close photo finishes. The race to end all races in 2019, when Mathieu van der Poel did his thing and became the first Dutch winner in a long time. Now, this is the route, 253.6 kilometers in total. Slight change this year. There are 33 hills in total, but a slightly different road to take on as the breakaway goes. And then the routes and the loops have been mixed up a little bit as well. One less passage of the Kalberg, but plenty of familiar names out there as we go to close to the highest point in the Netherlands on the border with Germany. We briefly go into Belgium as well. And then you have the familiar climbs. Kalberg, Hulemerberg, the Kederberg is the new one, the Bemelberg, the Lohberg. Go down to Hooper, Kralsberg, and the deadly Kuttenberg. 30th hill before we have one final lap, including Kalberg, Hulemerberg, Bemelberg, and then that run in towards the finish. This was a scene this morning in the main square in Maastricht, is Tadej Bogacha came back to the Amsterdam race. This time is the favourite, and with the UAE Emirates squad looking to try and control things. Well, Paul's here as well. Limberger at home with a strong Bahrain victorious team trying to challenge their Emirati rivals. Either Skelling one to look out for. Steph Clement here riding for Jumbo Visma. Jos van Emden on the start list. And there's uh, Stenjek Stibar chatting to Michal Kwiatkowski. And it was mid to late morning when things got underway. Cold day out there today in the Netherlands. Plenty of rain jackets on, one leg warmers out there as well. But there were problems here or there. Tom Pidcock with a flat tyre early on and a bike change needed in the neutral zone. Once the official start was made, it wouldn't be too long before seven riders got up the road. The breakaway formed in the first 10 kilometers of racing today. Vatsek, Heinschke, Ludwigsen, Fedeli, Urianstad, von Hof and Vercher were the riders out in the break. I could tell you that with 91 kilometers to go, it's been a fast race. It's been ridden at around 41 average so far and the break has already been brought back. A new attack has just gone at the top of this hill, you can see. Around 12 riders have managed to break away. And this is an ever-evolving situation. Interesting to see who's doing the chasing here. As we get out there, we just have a 90 k's to go. And it looks as though Christian Jensen is in this group, and it looks like rather more than the 12 riders who were suggested to us. And look who's in it, Tom Pitcock's there. Oh, this is a mighty group. Three riders from Kupama FDG as well. Looks as though Johnny van Meers is there. We've got representation too from Sudahal Quickstep, who have had quite the horror spring in the classics. And Kufidis with a rider in there as well. Looks as though there's one representative too from Jumbo Fisma. And we're having early fireworks with 90 kilometers to go in the Amstel Gold Race. It's only a short gap at the minute. 16 riders, we think, looking at maybe 20 to 30 seconds maximum. And this is what's left of the peloton. Now, who is going to chase? Because there's lots of teams represented. Ineos Grenadiers with their riders up to the front. But remember, with Pipcock already in that move, you doubt that they're going to do much chasing there. One of their riders has suffered a crash, by the way, in the last half an hour. That was Josh Tarling. I think he's still in the race with Martin Svrichek of Sudal Quickstep and Daryl Impey involved in that one as well. Meantime, this is the head of the race. Disappointment today, by the way, at the start for Alpecin de Koenig because there's no Quinton Hermans. He's still out with an illness and he's trying to recover in time for Flesh well on on Wednesday. Looks like Hugo Uhl might be in this group as well. There's certainly representation front of the main bunch from Israel, so they've obviously missed out, pardon me, if they're doing the chasing there. This is the first look we're getting at the race here, and trying to work out the situation. 
Hannah's alongside me trying to see who's at the front of the race as well. This looks like a, a decent effort from Vermeers. Behind two riders, at least from Group Armour. One of them looks to be Kevin Juniet, the former national champion of Luxembourg. I see Christopher Yul Jensen there as well for Jaco Alula. And a few riders are already at the race on the side of the road looking for the team buses. Anna Walker alongside me, Rob Hatch. Um, it looks as though it's kicking off. We're trying to see the situation in the race. It looks like there's around 16 riders out there. It's been ever changing from what was a very consistent breakaway that we had earlier on that sort of gained that maximum time gap of just under five minutes. Things have changed dramatically, uh, dr drastically or dramatically. Let's combine Both two words. <laughs> um, they've changed drastically on the road into this final 100 kilometers. Interesting that there. Sheffield's there with him as well. Left-hand side. Juniets is there, Ben Healy, yet again. What a rider he's becoming. I mean, his performance on Wednesday, taking that second place in Brabant Pearl. One week on now from being in the feed zone at Paris Roubaix, and he wanted to try and get get a feel, get get some sort of knowledge as to what goes on as a, a worker of a team and, and what the, the logistics of it is at the side of the road, handing out bottles and, and now into this select group. I know a move. It looks like this uh, might well be Schmid. So now quick steps, Mauro Schmid off the front. The rider chasing him, by the way, is Robert Stannard. His sister's just ridden the women's race, actually. New signing for her team, the uh, Israel team. But Robert Stannard riding in Belgium for Alpacine. One rider representing UAE at the back here. Remember that everybody's looking at Tadej Pogacar today and, and everybody talking about that most overused of words this spring, anticipation. And they're wanting to get to the head of the race before Pogacar does that. Maybe one of the reasons why that group went away, but it looks like now it's all broke back together. It's almost when you've got that larger well, that's group. That's the second group that was chasing. So you've got the two groups behind who have just merged together. You've still got this select group who is up the road. And as you say, Rob, it's almost anticipating the anticipation of the anticipation within the race, isn't it? It's, it's anticipating when the favourites perhaps are, are going to try and make their move. Pogaccia, also, uh, you see Dorian Gordon on good form after Wednesday. Winner of the Bravo Sapel. And this is our first look at Tish Benoit moving up on the right hand side. Now, 236 pulling here is Guillaume Boivin. And DSM are also moving up on the right hand side. Attila Valter, keep your eye on him. So good in the Strade Bianche earlier on this season. And we hope that rather like uh, Demi Follering and Lotte Kopecki has patched up any differences with Benoit. A little further back, Rick Van Avermaet. Situation of this race starting to settle down. Up in the front group, here's Magnus Sheffield. Andres Kron is there as well, alongside Arjen Levens. Sobrero is the man with your Jensen. Alexei Lutsenko has come straight from Sicily, and look who's straight to the front. They try to get ahead of Togacha. The man we saw hiding at the back of that group is, in fact, Tadej Pogacar. So if you're not in the front now, you might have missed out. Juniette is there, Pacher is there, Deletre, Healy we've seen as well, Van der Sande is the representative of Jumbo Fisma. And Tadej Pogaccia off in this front group of around 16 riders. Breakaway was reeled in, the bunch is split, and the split includes the big favourite. He's no teammates with him. We know that Tom Pidcock's in that front group as well. Time for us to take a breath, look up the road, and say hello to Shaloon Castle. Standing majestically there around the water. There's many at home today because they'll all be watching this man. 85 kilometers to go in the Amstel Gold Race. No Father Pool today, no Fanart, but there is Pidcock to try and challenge Tadej Pogacar. Pitcock, who suffered from a concussion that made him miss quite a good chunk of the classics this year. Starting with San Remo, but so good to see Lutsenko here. He was on a plane yesterday from Italy. 
the winner in the overall, taking the final stage with the GC in Sicily and a much needed victory, Anna, from Astana Kazakhstan team that couldn't buy a win at the start uh, of the year. I was just going to say, it's a, again for another team who really wanted a, a victory and perhaps needed a victory just to turn things around within the team, all, almost give everyone that little bit of morale, a bit of motivation. And uh, I think with Lutsenko taking that final stage and the overall to go with that, I mean, so far they had only had one victory with with Velasco, and that was in Valencia on stage three when he took a fantastic win. But for for them, it, the the wins have been evading, and the, the, some of those those top results, even the consistency hasn't really been there for Astana Kazakhstan team and for for Lutsenko. On a day like today, it's we've seen before where he's been fantastic in one day races, and when you take a look at how much elevation there is, uh, elevation gain there is today. It's almost like a Grand Tour mountain stage. You know, we're, we're, we're talking over 3,400 meters of elevation within 255 or 253 kilometers of racing, and it's relentless. There's no stopping point on the roads. Whoever tells you the Netherlands is flat is lying. <laughs> we're in the hilliest part of the country here. And we're looking at the front of the leading group that includes Pitcock and Pogacar. Not the only names to contend with, though. There's Pitcock on the left-hand side, just getting ready for action. Pogacar taking it up up the front. On one of 33 different climbs on this race. And here's the full group. It's Pitcock, Sheffield, Van der Sander, Vermeers and Pogacar. Joining them at the front of the race, Ben Healy, Lars van Berg, and Kevin Junietz. Quentin Pachel is the third rider in there. Alex Zeigler, a really interesting rider to watch for Kofidis. Lutsenko, Jul Jensen, Sobrero, Livens, and Kron. The last two representing a Lotto Destiny team who also have had a long time without a win in the Classics. So 16 riders, 84 kilometers. Well, Pogacar straight on the attack. He's just such a good watch. But I'll tell you what, riders in this group, though, are in form. I'm looking at the man in the pink there, Ben Healy. What a midweek he had in the Brabant Appel, in second to the eventual winner, Dorian Godon. And you think that they're one of the teams who will be under pressure to do a bit of chasing behind here because they don't just have Godon, they have Benoit Cousinefroy, who was second last year. In fact, for a while he thought he won until the photo finish sort of took it off him. And they're not represented, that team, as you deserve up in the front here. They're, they're not, and especially with the form and, and given also how, how big this, this race is for, for the team also. And they'll want to come back and almost make amends of, of last year because, I have to say, a very gracious uh, moment for Benoit Cosnefort when he was eventually told that you haven't won the race despite the excitement and the celebrations already going on, but you, you did finish second. Now we've reviewed the, the photo finish for... For Agent Suatitren also there, they've got Greg Van Avermaet, Michael Sharp, uh, Michael Schirel. Stander Wolf has been on the back foot a little bit, he had a mechanical. Interesting that there's a few Ineos riders trying to come up to the front here, Astana as well, just not blocking the road, but, you know, sort of taking their time if they can. Coming towards the edge here the entry into this main road, one of the many bits of road furniture that the riders have to contend with in the Amstel Gold. It's always mentally difficult, isn't it, with the lefts and rights. And it's rather like the Tour of Flanders here. In fact, Pogacar this morning when he turned up said he did the recon and he thought it was even more technical than the Tour of Flanders. It's one of those races whilst, of course, you don't have all the cobbles that you have to contend with in Flanders. There's so much focus needed to make sure that you're in the right position because there's parts of the road where you're almost going on to a single track lane that perhaps is only used for the farmers to get around from field to field. And so if you're out of position at that point and the race starts to go away and it goes up ahead, incredibly difficult to, to bring things back together. And you talk of the road furniture here. I think this is one of the few races on the calendar and, and in the country where they've removed some of the furniture, the road furniture, I'm talking about the central reservations or the islands, especially on this run-in as well into the final few kilometers where they get rid of them and then they replace them once the race is gone. So trying to minimize where possible the amount of road furniture, thankfully. I think sometimes you almost 
wouldn't suit the, uh, the road furniture, especially when there's some action on the road. And here we go. Look at this. Down into Falkenberg, and it's Tadej Bogaccia who leads them down. Karl Bernstein then. And for the first time in this race, two passages this year, as opposed to the usual three. And Tadej Pogacar's on the front, just testing the water. He has Tom Pitcock on his wheel, Alexei Lutsenko in third. Vachel's not far behind as well. Look at Ben Healy in the pink, ready for action. The man from Sudal, quick step. Here is uh, not there as well on the right hand side. There's Junietz. Ooh, and already problems for von der Sander which might change the ingredients, really, to get Yombo working behind. This is certainly going to change the dynamic of the race now that he's been distanced. And at the moment, it doesn't really look like there's too much fight in van der Sander, whether there's been a call from behind that he's been asked to come back here, because that was a, a very, as soon as the, the acceleration went, he's not reacting. There's no rocking and rolling the, of the shoulders sort of signaling that he doesn't have the legs. I think the, the tactic is going uh, in another way. They've also got Attila Valter back there, Tish Panut, Sam Uman, Chris Lehmreiser. Now then, behind we do have movement. There is Tish Panut on the right-hand side. We're also seeing Benoit Kuznefroy here. He wants to make sure he can try and get up there if he can. Pascal Lincoln of Lotto Destiny, the Dutch national champion, also there in second I'm wheel on Kuznefroy's wheel. Litsenko at the front. Other riders dropped, include Arjan Levens from this group behind. There is uh, Zangler holding on. Coming towards the top of the car here, but still just continues to climb that little bit. The thing is for van der Sander having dropped back, and there he is, there he's just about to be absorbed by this group. Can he be of any use? The thing is, with the gap only being around 30, 35 seconds at the moment, it was a perfect opportunity for him to drop back and help where needed. If you're going to do it, do it when the gap is smaller. Bernot is trying to do this. We went on to this climb with, I mean, we haven't had the time gap up on screen, but we're estimating about 30 seconds. Pogacar certainly continued to put the power and look behind. The group is breaking up, and this is already a war of attrition. First passage up the Kalberg on the Amstel Gold race with 80 kilometers to go. And this is the front group. It is Stam von Tricht who's in there as we look at Pogacar. Camera's naturally going to follow him. Turning up in the Amstel Gold race. And hoping to join another of those select clubs he's already a member of on several fronts. Of course, Tour de France and Amstel Gold Rail winners in the past. Eddie Merckx, Bernard Hinault, Job Zutemelk, and Bjarne Ries. Just four riders in that club at the moment. He joined the Selector Club in Flanders the other week, and here he is. At the front. Ten riders remain in the front group then, just under 80 kilometres to go, and we will get a time to gap now. They're racing well in Kulpana, still well represented here. Juniette's on the left-hand side. This is Kron for Lotto Destiny, the only remaining rider. Vinmir's just done well to hang on. But the gap's not going to be huge because there's been quite a bit of movement behind. Good thing that this lot have had has been the free running smaller groups into the corners, the turns. And what they've done as well, if riders get back in behind now, it's it's a smaller group, it's a different race, it's a more attritional race. The, the thing is, Rob, with them being in a smaller group, it works to their favour that you're not having those big accelerations when you're in, a, in the larger peloton of having to make an acceleration to close gaps or try and move up or the stress of making sure that you're into some of the really important parts of, of the course and especially as we head towards uh, the, a trio of climbs up, coming up, it means that it almost works into their favour. You're saving energy whilst you're out front. Of course, you've got a little bit more wind, you've got less shelter uh, with the less riders around you, but stress factor-wise, it, it's much better being out front for the 10. I thought we were going to have a time gap, <laughs> but nobody decided to put a clock up for us. <laughs> still, Too much excitement. <laughs> exactly. Still, I'd say still around half a minute. Oh. 
So the right turn here, and then we go into quite a quick descent into the uh, Kulemmer Berg. And this is what's left in front, 10 riders. Zangling, quite the company here, the young Frenchman, 24 years of age from Mulhouse, not far from the German and the Swiss border. Really good midweek, didn't he, winning the Loire Atlantique a month ago. Um, just a few days ago, he was fifth in Brabant's Pale. Last year winning a couple of French Cup races as well. Had a really good start to his career. From the same Etube cycling club, by the way, that the Yates brothers rode for. So the fast descent this. And if you've not seen this before, thankfully the roads are drying up a little bit, but it's not going to be dry by the end of the race, is it? We've had quite the bad weather today, Hannah. We have it's a, a stark contrast from yesterday where the sun was beaming down on the Limburg region here and with the rain it was it was it's cold it's it's cold 8 degrees you've got a north northwesterly wind sort of 13 14 kilometers per hour and it's only within the last half an hour or so that the the mist and the fog and the, the low lying cloud has started to lift up really but it has meant that the wind has has begun to it's become a little bit stronger as well, and especially onto this this finishing straight into that final sort of 1.8 kilometers, where almost to be turning into a headwind now. I just wonder if that's going to influence any attacks. But in the last few years, we've seen attacks sort of go and small groups come into there. It might influence when a sprint is launched, as you see the castle at the bottom of the hill and the Hölemerberg. And this is Tom Pitcock. He's at the group uh, or the head of a group, I should say, of 11 riders actually. And this is Tish Benel trying to come across. We estimated around 30 seconds. It's just been below that and it's just grown back to that. Sam Oman now with Tish Benel sitting a little further back behind. Trek Segafredo not represented as well. They'll be the one to do a bit of chasing. Right, you miss any group that Tadej Pogacar goes into or Tom Pitcock and, well, you know that it probably wasn't a group to miss. As we see Healy there some discussions into the radio Ben Healy this, that's been the second or third time you've seen him on the radio here is Sam Oman his team leader sits in around sixth place there's Kwiatkowski defending champion third wheel former world champion actually won in the rainbow jersey here quite a while ago he repeated his victory last year and another of those photo finishes Quite synonymous with photo finishes here, the Amstel Gold. I've been told they've upgraded the equipment. This oh, year. good. Oh, good. Finally. Much to Pidcock's delight. I <laughs> <laughs> can't change that result. He still believes he won that one. <laughs> Keep it down. We're close to Belgium. Eh? There is Pidcock <laughs> on the left hand side. We've had a dip into Belgium today as well, haven't we? The race has got into Belgium today, of course. It's a wonderful area that if you come here and ride your bike, you can have quite a nice ride and dip into three different countries. It's quite, a, it's quite special, isn't it? It's close to the German border and there's lots of brilliant, brilliant cycling roads around here, of course, for whether you're just coming for as a, as a tourist and just want to enjoy some brilliant and, and beautiful countryside. Sam Oman, Dutch climber on the left-hand side in the yellow and black jersey. That's his Flemish leader in sixth place we think he's riding for here. Also in the pink jersey alongside Bernard is Nilsson Paulus. American rider who's cut quite the spring. He's in the form of his life. Looking at Søren Kral there. He's among the top ten. All riders who want to be there if another move goes. Paulus, for me, we take a look at his, his Palmares over the past few months. Mr. Consistency, I think he can be, be renamed because it's been very special to watch the way that he's raced. So you think back to two weeks ago at Flanders and how incredible that was for for the american i think a really really exciting prospect and i always remember his victory at san sebastian a few years ago and the way in which he won it was likable character as well so on the main road out of bedek this is where they head on to a new loop by the way they don't return immediately to the car bedek. that will come much later in the race this year so that's one of the changes Still 33 hills to be taken on, however. And 25 seconds. 
There is Paulus, who we were just talking about in that pink jersey. And here's his teammate up the front. Anna and I sitting at the finish line here, and we're seeing the old rider come in and ride to the finish line. A couple of riders already out for Bora Hyanskura, including the national champion, as well as Giovanni Aliotti. Surprising as well, just moments ago, David Godieu rode past also distance from that group, so that's a big surprise from the Frenchman. That's Group Armour FDJ, I wasn't surprised, well, I wasn't expecting to see him distance so early on in the race. You would think he'd be he heading into form now, certainly with uh, his, one of his favourite races, he's been on the podium before, Liege coming up in a week's time. Trink team here at the back will be pretty happy that his mates up the road. Of course, if there is a group to go across, then Pogaccia might do with some support, but he showed before he doesn't necessarily need it. This is a section of road that could benefit the Peloton, but are there enough teams working? It seems to be just Sam Omen here. Ineos riders waiting, watching. It's a perfect position for them. As you can see, Jai Hindley, the winner of the last Giro d'Italia, just making his way up there wearing his jersey, number 41. In fact, it's Aleotti up there alongside him. The rider who didn't finish was Luis Joel Lewis. And now we've got a collection of Jumbo Visma riders coming to the front. It's about time, really, isn't it? 32nd, the gap has grown. Yeah, we, it's one of those there's parts of, of the course where make the most of it while you can. And there's uh, one rider who's rocketed himself off the, the front of the peloton at the moment. It's to be but from Arkea Samsic. Hey, the rider in question from Arkea Samsic is uh, Louis Bar. Well, he's being chased down. Number Visma keep looking around, almost looking for some assistance from another team, but with Ineos Grenadiers right on their tail, well, they're not going to come through having had both Tom Peacock and Magnus Sheffield in that front group. Here's Lemrez just in front of Jos van Emden there, and then Sam uh, Omen. Jos van Emden is in a great position here with Kwiatkowski still in this group. Heiduk alongside him. Josh Tarling, thankfully, back after that crash, and Connor Swift. And of course, up the road, Pitcock, who is with Sheffield. A couple more Jumbo Visma bodies getting back in towards the back here, who could start the help. and. Let's not forget there's another driver in there who belongs to the team, but of course he's wearing his national champion's jersey, the Hungarian champion, Attila Valta, one of the two protected riders we think in that team. Yeah, you'd say so, wouldn't you, with, with Attila, Velt, uh, Attila Valta uh, uh, along with Tish Banut for Jumbo Fisma. When you take a look at that helicopter shot and you see just how many riders in yellow and black jerseys that they do have in this group, one of the most represented teams here, and still plenty of of options to play for. Still a lot of riders making their way back through the, the convoy. This is Cyrus Monk, actually, and it's his World Tour debut. The Australian today, racing for Q36.5. That's champion in Corn. Now the Belgian team, Lotto Destiny. We head back towards where we started here, Maastricht, but turn left before we get there. And it's time to head out into another loop. will be the Kederberg. 71.6 kilometers to go. The way it traverses itself around this lumbar region is... Could, can certainly can confuse a, a few... Ooh. Now then. Has he been caught on the uh, the wrong side and found mm. himself on the bike path? Oh. Well, he hasn't used it to gain an advantage, so you no, won't think all. that there will be any punishment You'd there. Hope not there. You'd certainly hope not, but... The reason we're really making a bit of a point in this because it's Dorian Godon, the rider who won on Wednesday at the Brabant Sapel. But of course, there's been a lot of talk this week, hasn't there, online specifically from the new rider safety representative Adam Hansen chatting to riders, and certain riders have said, Well, hang on a minute, what about the riders who ride on footpaths? We want the VAR, we want them to be eliminated. And well, we'll see. Well, we've seen in the last few weeks just the the chaos that is caused, not just in the men's race, of course, from that, that famous crash from two weeks ago, but also in the women's race as well, that it's caused some yeah, some pretty nasty crashes. Uh, it, it's It's been great, actually, I have to say, to see the work that Adam Hansen has been doing. 
and how proactive he's been having only just been selected but to be the the head of the cpa the, the cyclist professional uh, association that's effectively the riders union and he's been going around in itzulia handing out his questionnaires what do you want to change what you know, give us give us the feedback talking to teams canvassing opinion out of hands and yeah, I, I, I'll go back to that point there with, with Dorian Gordon. I would say that that's a different incident. He was caught on the footpath because of all the road furniture turning the corner and wasn't really trying to gain an advantage. I'd say lost position, if anything. It's it's one of those which really it has to be assessed case by case scenario and, and situation, doesn't it? Common sense. If there's any of that left in the world, well, not quite sure. <laughs> I think it's run out. <laughs> 32 seconds for Tadej Pogacar and 10 mates up the road. 70 kilometers to go. This is Junietz. Teammate in here. And just under 35 seconds down on the road. This is the peloton, or what's left of it. Started with 175 riders today. They've been whittled down one by one, a race of attrition. Now Bahrain start to contribute. Milan there racing hard on the front as we look at Cherel on the left hand side. We had to deal with a lot of bad luck, Bahrain victorious. Nikki Hassan has been on the front for, for a while, trying to do some of the, the chasing or at least keep things under control. But you, you take a look back to Gent Weather again when Mati uh, Mate Mohoric was in a, a strong position to go for the victory, slid out on that final corner. There's lots of illness, mechanicals, sometimes just not being in the race, and you, you can't really put that down to anything. It's just, unfortunately, weren't there and, and no results. So really want to try and turn things around and at this point in the season, especially as we head towards the Ardennes and near closer to the Giro d'Italia. Well, is going to have to stay thirsty for now. Just missed the bead on on the radio straight away, asking for another. I think it's the team cars not yet in the gap. Gap not quite big enough for team cars to come through and for Pagacha to take a feed. Here's the moment he missed it. Oops. Can't do everything perfectly. <laughs> He is human after all. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Into the final 70 kilometers then. A lot of racing to be done today. And we know in recent years that the Amstel Gold race isn't done until it's done. And even then, there might be some arguing over the photo finish. I have to say, sometimes I think this race is one of the, the most underrated races because it is so open. It, it does attract so many different types of riders. And it's... It is unpredictable. You think back to last year, who would have said that after the the injuries that Kwiatkowski had, had suffered and, and come back from and with illness, that he'd be the one to take another victory in the Amstel Gold Race. And it's always got that that suspense, even just what's going to happen into the into the finish. But then also after the finish, with the, the finish has been so close together and, and separated by millimeters of a... Oh, See that road furniture there, riders just having to, to avoid. Kierdeberg is the next climb. It's on to the route for the first time. Not a name you'll have been familiar, at least in recent years, in racing. Just in that Jan is continue to ride. Jos van Emden as Michal Kwiatkowski has a quick word. Nikias Arndt returning to the front now. New signing this year for Bahrain Victorious. Grand Tour stage winner, let's not forget Arndt at the Vuelta España. And there's Tudor Pro cycling on the left hand side, really punching above their weight. Fabian Cancellara's team. Another win in the midweek, that takes them to three since they moved up to being a professional outfit at the start of the season. It's remarkable, really, isn't it? When you put together a, a new team, of course, they were a, a lower level team last year, but when you put together a new team, new riders, new staff members, 
just sometimes it takes a long while for teams to knit together and to gel well. And for them, Tudor Pro Cycling, well, they've wasted no time in already taking those victories. And I think even the camaraderie that you see at the bus before the start and the staff members all very happy. There's lots of smiles between the riders also that if you, you're feeling good, if you're feeling happy within a team, you can do also, of course, the training has to be done. The form has to be there. You have to race smart. You can't just throw away the throw away the legs just because you're sort of happy within a team. But it counts for a lot that if you're you're feeling good mentally, that the, the good results also start to come. And for Tudor Pro Cycling, with a few options here, really, when you take a look down who they've brought, Alex Camp. Also here, Arta Klukas, the Luxembourgish rider. Pickpock on the front. And heading up the Beamleberg before we go out to that brand new climb I told you about. Hard to follow the course, isn't it? Even when it's out there in front of you. <laughs> Squiggly lines all over a map. It's, it's a mad, crazy, entertaining race. That's why I say you, you, you traverse your way around the Limburg region and you switch back on yourself, you cross roads that you've just, you've been at the crossroads maybe 50 kilometers earlier. There's, it, it, it's very, very different to the women's race where you do those four laps of that 18 kilometer circuit you're taking in, the Hulhemerberg, the Bemelberg, and then the Kauberg. And that is sort of the, the ending to the race. But I think, I think also the beauty of the fact that Amstel Gold Race, they do switch the course up each year or they add a new climb in or they change things or I think even with that change to the finish line that they that they made it, it really keeps the race open yeah taking the last Kalberg out I thought really changed the game didn't it and made it a much more open race to be attacked from distance and gives those the, the riders who who are opportunistic to, to be able to have their day also and to and to try something and it's uh, not out of the realms of possibility that things could uh, could go and stay that way. Mohoric sits ready. He's had awful luck this spring. Gap coming down here as Bahrain continue to ride. 26 seconds. 11 riders up the road. And at the back, well, those who've done their work coming to hang on. See if they can be useful further up. The race which sees gaps grow and then be reduced quickly as we hit the climbs. This is Hirs Lehmreza. First probably on a lot of your screens last year at the Giro d'Italia. Not going to be in the team for it this year. Team already announced. Primoz Roglic and company on the way. They'll be happy that this man's not here. Are they Bogaccia? Well, the numbers are crazy, aren't they? They are absolutely crazy. Last race a couple of weeks ago in the Ronde of Flanders, he won that, of course. Just the third man ever to win the Tour and win the Ronde. Before that, he walked away with Paris Nice. He was fourth in San Remo. He was third in the Edri Press and Harald Baker. He romped home in the Vuelta Andalusia. And in both of his stage races this season, He's not only won the GC and stages, he's won the points classification as well. And he also won a brand new gravel race, only the second year of the Jaén Paraíso Interior. Sort of Andalusian Strade Bianca, if you like. He turned up and took away the trophy there. So it's a big week for him here. Amstel Gold for just the second time in his career. He actually rode that famous race that Mathieu von der Poel won in such dramatic style. It was his first professional year, and he was a non-finisher on that day. And how times change, eh? And it just shows how quickly things can change. Yeah. A year later, Tour de France winner. It's, it's a pure joy, isn't it? Every time that we see the, the big three on the screens and racing and battling it out, it's um, what, what an era we're in. I think it's quite magical. The other two of the big three we won't see for a little while. They're taking a rest after an early part of the season. Here's the uh, quarries, by the way, in uh, Groove Trot. A view from down here. 
won't be one that the riders will have time to admire. Maybe you could see something now because earlier on today you really couldn't see much. It's been a miserable day. Where I come from, they call this that fine rain that soaks you through. That's not a particularly sense-making phrase. It's a Northern English dialect, I'm afraid. So we won't dwell on it for too long, but it's just in the air, isn't it? Unfortunately, Rob and I are quite used to that. <laughs> <laughs> you can see you can't see much. It's a misty, foggy day. Not really befitting of moving into spring, firmly into spring now in Northern Europe. Been a nice last few days as well, sunshine out. Anna and I will be looking after yesterday, we sat in the sunshine and talking about this race. We thought we might be talking live about it in rather better conditions and with better views. But here, the view at the front of the peloton is that of Bahrain victorious chasing. Ineos is making a nuisance of themselves, aren't they? Yeah, they're just kind of getting themselves in the way, never too far away from the front. Connor Swift up towards the, the front there, just taking a drink. Also Kutowski, just patrolling things really, and like you say, making making a nuisance, just being in the way. You saw before when Jumbo Visma were almost looking for a, another team to give them some assistance. Well, they couldn't really see any of the teams because it was it was the Ineos Grenadiers who were there and in the way. So. I think as well, when you see the weather conditions like this, and when a lot of the riders would have woken up this morning, looked out of their windows, it's already thinking, oh, that, those kind of weather conditions, not quite not quite into this, not quite into the wet weather or the cold, don't really perform well when it's cold, and already you've lost sort of 20% of, of the field. Head of the race on your screen. And rather than heading now towards the Kalberg, as they would have done in the previous edition here, and now head out onto a new loop. It's Pitcock, Sheffield, Vermeers, Bogacar, Healy and Von Tricht. Accompanied by Lars van den Berg, Kevin Junietz, Alex Zangler, there is Lutsenko there. And also with them is Kron, good rider from Denmark. Here he is on the left-hand side in the light blue and red. Look at the roads they're racing through, housing estates, narrow farm roads. It's all the fun of the fair at this race. Seward Box here at the back. First year with UAE Emirates. Had a really good end to the year last year with his old team, Arpacita Koenig. Dutchman who took a really big win over in Italy, beating the lights of Alejandro Valverde before he just retired at the time. Now Josh Tarling. He's just in front of the rider from Astana there. And our rider, by the way, is Gianni Moscon. They're anonymous. Sarah Smont, Australian there. As I just mentioned, on a World Tour debut today, a big day in his career. <laughs> just hovering at over and under 30 seconds, isn't it? Not really shifting it too much, but they're making an effort to do that now. Even committing riders here, like Wark Pools. So they know this is serious and there's a danger that they could miss the move. And while legs are fresher, Bahrain want to either bring this back or bring it close enough so that the likes of Matej Mohoric can maybe get across. And, and knowing that the, the spring that they've had, it's, it's been a long time since they've had a victory. In the start of the season in Saudi tour with Jonathan Milan. And for Bahrain Victorious, this is when they're used to having lots of victories and when you're used to seeing Mati Mohoric go on a, a long escapade, it's not all gone their way. And at this point in the race, when you're onto this larger loop, it's it's almost, and knowing the strength and depth in this front group, bring it back before before it's too late. And especially while you've got some firepower within within your riders, within the, the, the other teams as well. Keep your eyes on Ben Healy. Quite the race in the midweek. Harsh to pick out a performance where he was second and maybe pick at it. The only thing he could maybe have been guilty of was maybe giving too much of himself and his attacks earlier in the race, but that's his style. It's, it's all learning as well. It's all learning. You, you, sometimes for some riders when they've had such good results in in their career and their young career and they're ever so consistent and they're always there in the race you kind of almost forget that it, it, 
22, 23 years of age, that there's still that learning to be done and you watch the races back, see where you can improve, see what you can do differently. And for for Healy, it's, it's quite magnificent to see that after one season with EF Education, coming from the development team of Trinity, where he spent uh, a couple of years, the the way in which he's sort of grasped the 2023 season, it's it's brilliant. You know, he's got uh, already that victory in GP Industria stage in the uh, Coppa Bartoli. Gaps really? come down now to just under 20 seconds as well. Healy, we were just talking about, still in that front group. And, and he, he's in a strong team today because we talked about Paulus as well. Copia Bardi was a fantastic week. Another man who had a good week there, Mauro Schmitz here too. Another rider who I think has never really given his credit that he deserves, Mauro Schmidt. Golden Greg making an appearance on the left-hand side. Match keeps plugging away. Remarkably, despite his age, despite his victories, he's never won in the Netherlands. Hasn't won anything since before the pandemic. He was in the breakaway most notably in the Entwevel game earlier in the spring. Here in the front though, it's only Bahrain victorious who are pulling. But they're doing a decent job here. While Paul's got somebody who knows the roads in this region. Home rider. This is Magnus Sheffield. Of course, last year the winner in Brabant Spel. This looks like it will be the American Cemetery. The only American Cemetery in the Netherlands. And where more than 8,000 soldiers who were killed during the Second World War were laid to rest. Tower 30 meters high there. And each of those white crosses represent a separate grave. It is uh, a sombering sight. Fifty eight kilometers to go. Thirty seconds to cap. Healy now in the pink at the front. This is Zangler now. Young French rider who has had good results on native roads. And Tom Pincock. Not many wins on the road as professional yet, but the wins have been big ones. Most recent coming in Strade Bianche. First pro win on the road came at Brabant Pale a couple of years ago. Back that up a, a season later with Alpe d'Huez stage from the breakaway in the Tour de France. He taught everybody a descending lesson as well as the climbing. And this year winning the full stage of the Volt Algarve, Tour of the Algarve, Portugal. And then Strade Bianche. Concussion suffered after that in Tirreno Adriatico. The 23-year-old Olympic mountain biking champion former cyclocross world champion, returned to racing at Dwarf de Vlaanderen, raced in the Ronde van Vlaanderen, and in Tour of Flanders said that he didn't feel right. That's how he explained away his 52nd place. It's a big week for him as he races Amstel, Flechwell on, Liège, and then will build up to the Tour de France. They're having to work really hard to try and bring this gap back in. It's swinging back, but are they doing enough, Hannah? It's... They're gaining three or four seconds. They're losing three or four seconds. And I'm surprised at this point that Bahrain Victorias aren't having a word with Jumbo Visma because before it was just Jumbo Visma doing the work without any other team. How about that each of the teams lends one or two riders? You share that workload up towards the front because effectively the the goal the outcome is is more or less the same in what they want to achieve uh, and how they want to 
to try something. Jumbo Visma is still sitting there with a the number of riders, but for, for Bahrain Victorious, you almost start to worry that if you do too much too soon, is that going to leave Mohoric quite isolated into the, the, the final parts of the race? Come to that tailwind section now as we start to head south. Heading towards the Lordberg. This, by the way, is the longest period in the race. Even though we are climbing, it's up and down roads, but the longest section of the race since the start, really, that we have between official classified climbs. So this is a good opportunity if you want to bring back some of that time to do it. When you take a look at the profile of the race, it's constantly up and down. There's never really that option where you can have a, a solid period of time to to close gaps because whilst it looks flat out on the, the camera shots, it's always that false flat. It's always that draining, the sapping the legs. It's just a long, arduous day. And it's only really been the first sort of 12, 12 and a half kilometers of the race where you're making your way up to Sittard that was actually flat. And you do need to, to make the most of the parts of the course where it does lend itself to the fact that the, the peloton behind or the very reduced peloton behind can close this gap. Starting to see a few tired legs, I think, in this breakaway. A few gaps opening up there at the back. I was about to ask you, do you think everybody's doing their share of the work here? Because it doesn't look the most organised, does it? Uh, it doesn't it doesn't really, does it? I mean, you, you saw Ben Healy up towards the back there. You know he's in good form just because of his recent results and the way that he's ridden. Zangler, he has been doing a lot of work. I'm wondering if he's really paying for it because he's been quite a driving force in, in this group of, of 11 riders. But Senko seems to have been active to me as well. We know he has good form and there'll be anxious thoughts in Astana, Kazakhstan that they need a World Tour win as well now. They've got that win in the Italian soil at the weekend. The longer it goes throughout the season without those wins, almost the the pressure builds on not just the riders but the staff members because you're thinking well what what can we do differently what can we do to try and take a big big win you've also got to satisfy your sponsors the team owners it's the, the pressure continues to build and i think for for Lutsenko, you know the fact that he was on a plane yesterday traveling to the race it, it, and i think also then carrying a lot of morale from friday's victory and the overall Still got a number of riders represented in this group. Well, you've got one rider on the right-hand side of the screen as we see it, and another on the left-hand side. Be interesting to see if Battistella is in this in this group as Senko just cleaning the glasses. It's not a sunglasses day, really, is it's it? It's not. Clear lens day, probably. <laughs> there he is at the back. Now then, at the front, we just saw Kron drift off the front there. Junyets, Von den Berg's with him as well. Possibly not the two riders that Kolpama wanted in this group. Junyets, you could say. Von den Berg, not known as a, a top climber. 32 seconds, though, as Bogaccia still committed. Von Tricht behind, too. Once more, Sudal quick step. Is that the rider they wanted in this group? waiting here. The team today without Julian Alaphilippe, by the way. Missing today. Question marks over. Coming Wednesday and next Sunday. Apprehension as well for Alaphilippe. You, you, you would think, having suffered that awful crash last year at Liège, it's a lot of question marks, what ifs, and think for oh, I think especially the, the amount of talk from your team manager it also doesn't doesn't help your your men you mentally either I look at it from the other point of view here if you're Pogaccia and Pitcock you're in a good group here you've got a gap you're not getting more than 30 seconds with 50k still to go are you happy about that or is it a tactical error have you given too much i think you've already got that that 30 seconds you're already on that front foot it just means that everybody else behind is is working so desperately hard to try and bring you back and you're almost having that 
smooth a linear ride as opposed to lots of stop starts within this peloton big accelerations fighting for position making sure you're in the right place almost that that worry well you've got a dangerous move up the road for pitcock and for pagaccia they must feel on in a very almost relaxed uh, position at the moment and pitcock wasting no time well we know he likes the downhills so gifted technically plenty of power in those legs as well and again now they've worked hard for this gap that's not something they'll want to give away easily he wants to get it going again just try and get oh no 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 crashes all over the place 103 down there is valentin madouas a big big name in trouble also number 221 Frederik Verdens and his teammate 225 that is uh, tobias johansson is down and hurt it looks like it might be good on the left hand side as well martin tusfeld is the man in the black and it is dorian godon the man who won on wednesday and this is how it happened hannah on these wet roads descending on the white line and look at godon he goes into the fence there <sighs> dearie me slipping and sliding there's a rider in the pink there too from ef education easy post i'm afraid for dorian godon that looks horrible Deary me. Into the wire fence there for Dorian Godot. You just see on such a almost benign part of the road where you're in the bike path, just how slippery the, and greasy the roads are because it's not been a complete and total downpour to wash away any of the grease or the oil that sits on the roads. It's just been almost sitting on the, the top layer of the surface on the asphalt, just making things greasy, and there was no way of saving that there. Problems too for Sandro Murisa. And there's been another crash now. It looks as though involving one of the motorbikes. There is obviously a big problem here. And that is Dohan Godon being attended to. He's out of the race now. Oof, the sort of stuff we really don't like seeing. It's, it's never, never nice to see something like that. And especially when riders are still on, on the ground. But it certainly changes the dynamic of the race now. Gap's grown to 42 seconds with that crash, and no wonder, because it did happen further back, but there's a shock factor there, and there's riders trying to get across. Also issues for Dries Devenein's caught up in that. He's required a bike change. From behind, you can see that Gordon's still being stitched up here. Lots of discussion and no real sense of urgency to have a bike change, get back on the bike. Alan, this is the Trek Segafredo team. And this is Tom Squinch. On his wheel is Matthias Skelmoser. Just behind Matteo Trentin. Then Jai Hindley, the left hand side, the man from Perth. The right, you can see Tish Benot. Ida Schelling is there as well. 50 kilometers to go in the Amstel Gold Race. 30 seconds for 11 riders, including Pitcock and Pogacar, and then a big crash behind has split the group into several. Next climb, it's the Lorberg. Climb 25 of 33. They'll feel it in the legs now, the second time up here today. And already, already, Lars Vonnenberg suggesting he might be the next rider to lose contact. It's hurting. Good Senko on the left. Bugaccia following him. And there's Von Trick, who's looking okay. It is a race of attrition, this. And this little acceleration here, allied to the crash, is building the gap that little bit more. It's going north and sitting just south of a minute. This is a scene behind. Mohoric is watching on. Benot is there. Scale Moza. And now Benot knows that it's getting serious, this, and they might have to do the work themselves, certainly with teammates maybe caught up in that crash as well. Can't see many other Jumbo Visma jerseys in this group now. This is Nielsen Paulus. The lights have gone out. 
Just wondering yeah. if he's hit the ground as well, you know. Yeah. I'm just wondering if he's hit the ground as well, yeah, because that is Nielsen Paulus hurting. You just look on the left-hand side, there's Mod there. He's got a little bit of a scrimp and scrape at the bottom left of the knee. And you really have to feel there for Nielsen Paulus because that, for him, is race over. Visibly in pain as well. You just saw the grimaces on the face. Must have been caught up in that. Real pack. shame. There we was a pink jersey on the left-hand side, as we saw it, before Dorian Godon. He was quite quick to his feet, back on the bike. I have to say, unless there's been another incident out of the picture, it must well have been at Nielsen Paulus. Horrible. Now, Vonnenberg here, not quite out of touch completely. But when you've already started to feel fatigued and depleted, there's only so many times that you can make this effort to chase back on. And doing it alone versus 10 riders up ahead who are sharing that workload, incredibly difficult for, for Vandenberg. Genietz on his own. But for him, I think you know, it would be very, very, it'll be a tough ask and a tall order to for him to see this group again. Comes from a good cycling family, doesn't he? Lars van den Berg, his brother, rides for EF Education Easy Post, Marijn van den Berg. Won one of the days in Mallorca earlier on this year. A big downpour on the way into Alcudia that helped him get away and stay away. Finally, the placed finish line the not related Julius Vollenberg is racing today for <laughs> EF Education Easy Post. Now then, 35 seconds. Trek Segafredo want to make something happen and Balkan Bollemer appears. Third wheel. Kwiatkowski's done a great job today just to mark this. Last year they played the Pitcock and Kwiatkowski cards well together, didn't they? And it was the pole who ended up winning the race. But this is such a small group now after that crash. Nearly in the centre of it, Schelling at the back of it. Green jerseys represented. There are three of them in there for Bora Hansgrohe who need a result. It shows how quick the race situation and scenario can change for a team. Whereas Jumbo Visma previously went from having five riders, six riders within this group, Tish Banut now completely isolated within this group. I don't even think I can see Attila Valter anymore. No. No Hungarian national champions jersey in that group. And for how well it was going for Jombo Fisma, he's not continuing on that path today. There are riders trying to get back in. Only one Jombo Fisma rider here, unless we can see Falter. Imagine that he's in this group because they are pulling, and there he is. There had to be a reason why there was the rider there from Jombo Visma pulling. It's like the shape of Omen on the front. And Attila Valter in the green, white and red, smack bang in the middle of that chasing group after being caught up in the crash. Forty six Ks remain. We've had the early attack, and now the unfortunate incident. This race always has it all now, then. There's a conversation there between the neutral service bike and Tadej Pogacar. We are down to ten riders in the front group, with Von Berg off the back. I wonder if he got that drink he was looking for a little while back, because remember, the car's still not been put into the gap here or if Pogacar does have a mechanical issue. If you come to an open, exposed part of the course now. It's it's no protection whatsoever here. This is where you're heading north now, and in straight into that headwind makes it difficult for, for anyone, especially those riders in some of the groups, if they're really starting to feel the, the tiredness and uh, all the, the, the race in the legs so far. Trek Segafredo up with strong numbers. feeling uh, that you've got tired legs in that front group. This is where the chasing group behind can really take advantage. Ten riders at the front of the race. Is Sheffield just getting back on. Should make it ten. Important really here for Pitcock. 
In fact, it's Pitcock getting back on. We've just seen Bogatcha off the back there as well, talking to the neutral service bike. Because we're not getting too many helicopter pictures, are we, of the bunch at certain stages in this race? It's easy to decipher the puzzle that has been this race so far. It's part of the charm. They hide away beneath the trees there. Next up will be the Hulperberg. Segafredo with probably the best numbers in the group here. See that Alexander Kamp still there with one teammate for Tudor Pro as well. Ante Marche, who had this as their first big one-day win, actually. A few years back when Enrico Gasparotto took the victory. They have one rider towards the back, and for the Australian team, Jaco Alula. Mateo Sobrero remains in there, having a good year, the Italian. Onto our next climb, then, and it's Alexei Lutsenko onto the Hooperberg. And this is a nasty one, it's a brute. 5.8% average per kilometre, but look at that, right inside, 18.4% maximum gradient. It's such a leg biter here, and for anyone who's starting to feel that fatigue, anybody who's really feeling what an arduous, attritional race this has been, this is where it can do some damage, and you're going to start to shell some passengers, no matter which group you're in. Now scale more up wants to attack from the bunch. They want to move this group, they want to shake up this race. He has Mollema with him. Mollema already telegraphed that he wanted to go from far out. Problem is, a whole host of riders beaten to it today. Trentin fighting to stay in. Smith's there as well. And Simon Clark shifting from right to left, trying to stay involved, of course he's the part of that famous Van der Poel win that many people often forget, but he was so close there, second place on the day. Back to the front, 34 seconds. Looking good then was Pascal Einkhorn in the Dutch national champions jersey, looking despite the very, very steep gradients of upwards of 18%, almost casual-like moving himself up on the, on the right-hand side of the screen as we just saw that. There's a certain someone who won in the Dutch National Champions jersey a couple of years ago as well, or four years ago now, back to that day when this place sounded like a football stadium. It erupted. And it just about sounded like they'd scored the winning goal in the World Cup final. That's for Nice from over the border in Belgium. Oh, gotcha. The Kuperberg is a horrible hit over for now. From the Huberberg, they will ne next head to the Krausberg. Twenty-two seconds, so the movement from behind, well, this group has stayed together, has shortened the gap. And it's really split the group up again. This is disintegrating here, just because of the sheer pace going up the, the Hulperberg then. So many accelerations, so much strength at the front with the tricks like Fredo wanted to drive things on the front. We've got another leg stinger coming up soon as well with real steep gradients. And this was the climb that we saw last year where, or a few years ago, where Ineos Grenadiers were driving things on the front. You seeing now. There's no real cohesion here in this group behind, as riders are just making their way back on. This is where, it, as the gap comes down to 20 seconds... Mohoric will try to use this moment to get across. He's good at this. He's so tactically strong that he picks the moments. We know he has the energy. He has the power. But up there in that front group, it, it, with all respect to people who are out there in a the morning break or in a Tour de France stage or something like that, this isn't a couple of riders from a professional continental team. This is a whole host, 10 stars out there that he's got to try and get across to. And, well, Sir Krause there. Tish Benoit, in corner, you mentioned third wheel. 
And this is where it starts to disrupt that chase because, of course, Klaus not going to go through. He's got Vermeersh up the road. And then you've gone from having the, the cohesion there where Mahoric has set things off, and then it's not continued. And again, another four seconds, six seconds given to the breakaway. There's nothing that is consistent in this chase behind. Fascinating. Mark Hirschi now in the chase for UAE, as we're back to Ben Healy at the front. 21 seconds. Von Berg failed to get back, and you can just see that Shunyet's shaking away that leg. They were well represented, Cool Palmer. They had three riders in the group. They're looking like they might be struggling a bit now, as it looks like it's Ida Skelling time. He has Trentin with him. Now Ian Korn goes on the right hand side. The gap's coming down, but again, stop start will not help them. There is Schelling. Great week in the Basque Country. He's a former winner, by the way, of a trophy on the podium here. The Hermon Krop trophy for the most aggressive rider prize. There's Kamp following well, the Danish champion. What a week pro Tudor Pro are having again. Another victory for them the other day. As Kwiatkowski always in danger in this race. Follows, follows, and will continue to follow a mark. Two times a winner. So here's Ian Quan. Trying to get this group going. The SM are represented as well. And back to the front. And back with Lutsenko. This is the whole group. Just under 40 kilometers to go in the Amstel Gold. It's Pitcock, Sheffield, Vermeer, Spogacar, and Healy with von Tricht, Junietz, Zangler, Lutsenko, and Kron. Ten riders up in the group. Ineos have two riders in there. Other riders did have teammates. And that's disappeared now. These are the riders trying to get across. Ida Skelling and Matteo Trentin just sitting on because he knows that Tadej Pogacar doesn't need any more competition at the front. And if he's going to get it, well, he's going to get some help because he'll come with them. 26 seconds. It's amazing because the gap really was, it was threatening to get to a minute. But even though every time it's come down, it's got to about 20 seconds and they've stayed out in front each time. And it's when that impetus has gone from the chase behind that Although they've got them almost in their sights up ahead, sometimes with these twists and turns, as you go through some of the housing estates, through some of the villages, you're out onto the, the lanes out in the countryside, is, I say, you're out of sight, out of mind. You're not really out of mind. They know they're up the road, but it's just knowing how bridgeable the gap can potentially be. There's a lot of riders who are perhaps, oh, there's a problem here for Pogaccia. Now then, Pogaccia. Bike change. And we know he was talking to the motorbike not long ago. So that was the deal. So Pogacar, with the gap down to 23 seconds, has to set off and has to dance on the pedals like only he can. In the meantime, at the front, Pickcock is picking up the pace. They're going on to the Carlsberg, and it's drama. It's alarm bells, because right at the back of the shot, you can see they're coming, and they're coming quickly now. And I wonder if this is the reason why that Trentin almost given that role to roll off the front. We know pogacar has got a problem. Get yourself back in the race. Perhaps you, you know, Pogaccio will need uh, some some help and assistance whilst he's exceptional. The gap, oh, it's... This is exceptional. Look wow. at this. What a chase back on. Now, the Krasberg is steep, is short. It's only 800 metres long. And by the top of it, he's going to be almost back on again. We're talking silly double-digit gradients we... here, but the power of Pogacar on show for all to see as Michal Kwiatkowski has a problem. It looks to be legs, and on the left, there's another mechanical problem. This time for Søren Kral. When you see double digits like this of 14, 15% and Bogaccia just riding his way back to this group. Wow. Chasing group with now Jai Hindley in it. Tishpanuk just in front of him. 
And that is Alexander Camp. They're playing, as I said, in Milan Turin earlier this season in the big boys league now. Wow. What a debut season at that level for Tudor Pro Cycling. Now let's reassess things at the top here. Because this race is changing, the gaps are shortening. The mechanical for Bogaccia has added that little bit of an extra carrot to chase. He or she was on his way, by the way, with Trentin. So there's one more body for UAE Emirates. And Pogaccia, not only getting close at the top, he's got right back in. He's smack back in the middle of the group. And that is a textbook way to recover from that mechanical problem. Holding on for all that time after he radioed in and had a chat with a neutral service. Having that change, powering up the hill, and now he's right back in it. It's the way that he keeps his cool, he keeps himself calm, that it's the lack of panic. The, the, not wasting any energy in panicking, it's just waiting, stay calm, the team car, when possible, will be able to get to, to him. And with such ease on the screen of in the way that he's, he's closed that gap. 20 seconds again. Even though they threatened to almost come back together at the top of that climb, once more, they're going to consolidate that lead a little bit here. Pitcock's at the front. Now, things have changed a little bit for the Neos Grenadiers because they do have, yes, Sheffield and Pitcock here, but we, they no longer have Michal Kwiatkowski in contention behind to do what he did last year. And we haven't really seen too much of any of the riders from the Ineos Grenadiers remaining in that group anymore, where we saw quite strength in numbers. Hajduk was up there, Connor Swift was up there. Tarling, remember, had the crash, didn't he? He rode on for a while and then was dropped. But it's now much more as we go into the Ezra Boswig, 900 metres at 9.6%. Again, double digits and high double digits. 17.4% there as the maximum gradient. In the chasers, no more bodies for Ineos Grenadiers, but we do have Benoit alongside Andrea Bajoli. Kamp was in that group as well. Jai Hedley, the winner of the last Giro d'Italia. Almost striking distance now. They've got them in the sights on this on this climb. Matthias Skelmorza is number 95. And they're 15 seconds behind. At the front, though. Well, the Toft Hair game's on strong today for Pogaccia. <laughs> Oh, he must be going well. <laughs> Back and forth. Not just a small tuft. Just keep your eye on Magnus Sheffield, because it looks like he's being dropped here. And that plan for the Ineos Grenadiers is narrowing even more because Pogaccia starts to accelerate. He knows what's happening behind. He's being told the story. And this is another big moment in the race. Tadej Pogaccia on the Ezer boss where gets rid of Jurnietz. He's already got rid of Sheffield. They're struggling to hold on behind at the minute. The only man who can act the pace is Tom Pidcock. Here comes Healy in the pink jersey. Lutsenko just behind Kron, trying not to crack. Eight seconds. Pogaccia, a man on a mission. But he needs to get rid of Pidcock. Peacock glued to the wheel there. He knows that he, he wants to be able to take on Pogaccia. He wants to try and have Amstel Gold in his Palmares. And at the moment, this duo going clear here. Only Healy is trying to come back at the moment. Lutsenko, despite his good form, not he able to remain there on the steep gradients. Healy would be a good ally, wouldn't he? Very, very good ally. And I think for, for Healy, he will Take a moment to recover from that effort of bridging across now, but will be certainly comfortable knowing that he can contribute to this move here. And what a way, what a place to be in, to be racing up the front in the top three of the Amstel Gold Race with Tade Pogaccia, Tom Pidcock. It's, it never ceases to amaze me, the strength in which Ben Healy is going from race to race. Lutsenko getting a little angry there with Andreas Kron. Conu's been a winner of some big races so far in his career. On World Tour stages in Catalonia and Swiss. Tadej Pogacar. 
Tom Pitcock, Ben Healy. The latter finds himself in esteemed company, but with the way he's been riding, deserved company. Now, group two is going to change. You've got riders advancing from what was left of the peloton and riders who've been dropped from the break. Alexander Camp's on a really good day, isn't he? There's Stan von Trick, too, being in that group. Jai Hindley. Not seen him in this sort of form for a while. Good news for him on his road to the Tour de France this year. He won't be trying to defend his title at the Giro d'Italia. The Tour de France route certainly suits him that much more this year. And now this is a road that will strike the fear into many. We're on our way now to the Fromberg. A little later on, we go to the steepest road in the Netherlands. As if you thought it couldn't get any steeper from the previous three climbs. It is horrible. The problem is with the climbs around here, because they are so short, sort of 800, 900, upwards, only upwards of about 1.1, 1.2 kilometers, they're not necessarily on their own hard climbs. It's just the accumulation of one after the other after the other consistency in which they come and also in quick succession on on some occasions throughout the the course shake of the head in the middle of that group there from Pogacar now has Ben Healy come through and taken a turn yet Again, as Hannah was explaining you could be allowed a minute's rest certainly after what he did but has he started to contribute this was a bit of an issue towards the end of the race the other day Senku's having the same battle there with Kron. And again, they're just tired legs out there. And once again, Hilly just sits on. It's that moment of Kron not coming through immediately when Lutsenko flicks the elbow that it, for Lutsenko really starts to, to get under his skin. And he's only taking short turns before Lutsenko is finding himself on the front again to try and close that gap. And for Kron, well, He's a fantastic climber. It's not like he's out of his comfort zone on a, on a race like today or on a course like today. Up here we go again. 33 kilometers remain in the Amstel Gold race, and we're on the Fromberg. A narrow gap of just seven seconds. At Senko, on the flat there with Kron, was closing the gap. Now it's Pitcock on the front. Healy's still just hanging on the back of this group. He'll be happy to be where he is. Pogacar's getting a little irritated with it. You can see the difference in the cadence as well between these riders. With Healy, much higher cadence, lower gear, or higher gear, should I say, for, po uh, for Pogacar and Pitcock. Lower down the block, keeping a nice, smooth rhythm at the moment. And I think you can already start to tell that Healy is really having to work hard here just to stay on the wheel of the duo. And then this hill as we get towards the top, the two behind have lost a few seconds. Another turn away from the top on the front bank. Bogaccia looks around the corner, surveys the difference, has a look at the damage. Here at the finish, riders come past on their way to the team buses. Just seen the face of Brandon Rivera looking on the big screen at his teammate in the middle of this group there as Ben Healy tries to hang on the back of the wheel of Tom Pidcock. Senko and Kron continuing their chase. No time gaps further back yet. There was a really good group coming along, led by the likes of Benoit, Hindley, Bajoli, Skelmorza. Alexander Kant was there too. It's the best Tom Pitcock we've seen for a while, isn't it? Probably since Strade Bianche. Concussion not really doing him any favours. And thankfully, we've taken out and rested. The protocol was respected. I think it's also that frustration when you know you're on good form, you know, especially after that tremendous victory at Strade Bianche. Then you go to Torino, you have that crash, and it's... The, what you don't want to do, you don't want to have to, to miss races or change racing schedules or have p prolonged periods of time off the bike, but in the end, certainly is, uh, 
the, the way in which the concussion can really take a long time to for, for riders to, to get over it. It's the precautions taken now from teams. There's that gap, Rob. It's is really starting to grow out again. Now, what's the gap to the next group? Because it's same 56 seconds there. We'll have to see. It's certainly growing up to around 13, 15 seconds now in this second group. They sort of missed the moment, really. Unless there's a looking around at the front again. There's still distance to go, isn't there? But that next group was being led, by the way, the last time we looked at it, by young Maxim Vok Hills of Lotto Destinies, having a great time with things. Real surprise to be in that company anyway. And he's another rider who's in some good form this season, and especially in the last few weeks with, he was in the breakaway for a long, long time in the Volta Limburg Classic. Yeah. He just missed the win there, taking second place. Lotto Destiny coming with, with a strong team on paper, but perhaps hasn't quite sort of uh, worked out for them. Sweeney always a strong, solid rider on the bike. Also Drizners. Aincorn was looking good for a moment, but then after that previous climb, you just really start to see that bit of a sting in the tail. It's showing one minute and one now to that next group, and that could be a gap that tells a big story is how it's going to go. 30 kilometers to go. Yes. I just come to the back in a bid to really entice Ben Healy now out, or at least force him to do some work. There's only so long that you can sit on the back of a group that's also riding towards the finish and, and going for, for the victory here. You can't have a free ride, you can't be a passenger. You, at some point, you're going to have to contribute and at, the, at the same breath. Pogaccia also needs a wheel to follow just to give himself a, a little moment of, of respite. Let's not forget the momentous movement that he, that he made when he was trying to get back on after that mechanical. I think for, uh, for him, he also knows how strong Pitcock is, Rob. He knows how fast he is if this comes down to a sprint between the duo. Into that final 30 kilometers now, and the, the third group at one minute and three seconds is listed on the screen with Benoit and Vermeersen there. Zangler van Giels, Kamp and Junjet von Tricht had been in the group. It's now Bajoli who's in there. Hindley. Scale Moors, as I mentioned. And at the front, it's 11 seconds now in front of the other two chasers. Translates to almost 200 metres. And this is the left turn now that will send fear into the hearts and minds of anybody who knows where it leads. Because we are on our way to the Kürtenberg which is the steepest road in the country. A short section of 22% maximum gradient. The hardest section after just a couple of hundred meters coming up. They go through the caravan site here, and it's the hill up to the right hand side of the picture that's straight, that's steep, that is gonna hurt the legs after already 225 kilometers of racing. And it's that initial first section of the climb that's a real burner. And it's only after around 400, 450 meters where then it does relent. You leave the double digits behind and then you're into 3%, but it's that long slog over the top. It's four kilometers closer to the finish this year as well. There we go, 1.2 Ks long maximum. Well, that's a lie. It's up at 22%, I can tell you. An average of 9%, the curtain there. And look at this. Pogacar looking good, now Healy's really fighting. Oh dear. And Healy, Healy is hurting. He sees the gap opening up. Pidcock able to stick to the wheel of Pogacar for the moment. They're over the steepest part, but Healy is hurting. And now Pogacar starts to power away as well. Today Pogacar opens the gap to Tim Pidcock. And this could be the moment that Pogaccia rides off on his own. It's a long way to the finish, though. The question is, will he want to? But then again, you look about it, you think about it. It is Tane Pogaccia we're talking about. He's over the top of the curtain bed, and Tom Pidcock has shown his first sign of weakness in this race. Well, they don't call it the nickname of the curtain biter for no reason, the calf biter. Ouch. You say, well, 
the 28 kilometers to go until the finish. Can he go all the way? Well, there's not really anyone behind who's got the strength and depth from any team to be able to bring any of these three riders back. Never mind Pogaccio, who's off on a solo escapade. That bigger third group we saw, by the way, is at a minute and 15 seconds now. Now, Healy and Pidcock can work together. They have to do. It's how much can each other give in order to bring back Pogaccio at this point, because you're already seeing it's one blow after another. You, you start with a, a sugar cube and every effort that you make, you're chipping away at that sugar cube and you're only left with sometimes the minuscules of sugar left in, in the system. And this was the moment that Pogaccio from first wheel just put in a, an acceleration, put it down the block, seated acceleration as well. And Pickup, where he had that reaction to match every move of Pikachu earlier on, you really start to see the difference between these two riders now. Player one out the front. We said it was like PlayStation cycling with this boy. Players two and three, game over. <laughs> I'm amazed. I'm amazed that so many teams, even earlier on at that 100, to, 100 kilometer to go marker, allowed not just Pincock in that breakaway, but Pogaccio as well, and that they didn't close it with immediate effect, that they let them dangle out front for so long, and they've tried to get a hold of it, they've tried to get a grip on it, but never quite been able to, to bring things down here. Latest time check, it's 141 to the big group now. Now that is some gap to close. Certainly without the big firepower of a big peloton. I think calling it the big group, there's about eight or nine riders in it. Group three, by the way, is Lutsenko and Kron. They are now at 40 seconds. Group two, Pidcock and Healy. That's Hayes 11. They really need to get something back because you know that when it comes to the climbs, Pogaccia will just blow their doors off. Twenty-six and a half kilometers to go, and yet again, Tadej Pogacar has turned up and has blown everybody away. This is the difference at the minute. Fourteen seconds, it's just bit by bit growing away. Healy will do what he can here, but is there anything left to contribute? Because it's all Pitcock right now. Uh, Healy will come to the front. Of course, there is a podium up for grabs in the Alstel Gold race, which would be Healy's... I mean, he's, he's won some races, but for me, this would be the top result of his career. It's, it certainly would be. You know, you, you see the consistency in which he's had this season, wins, podiums. I think he's one of the riders that's had the most top tens of any professional rider in the peloton this year. And you, you're right, Rob, when you, you take a look at the... The prestige, the prestige within this race. This would be one of his best results if he could, if he could stay in this podium position here. And the way it's looking, as Lutsenko um, and his his breakaway companion Kron, uh, sorry, his chasing companion Kron, not making any inroads. I think something drastic is going to have to happen from that larger one, well, larger group of, of just uh, over 10 riders behind are, are doing and it's just depleted it's completely disintegrated this race in an attacking move and a breakaway with already a hundred kilometers to go today Pogacar he was with 16 riders they only ever really got 30 seconds bit by bit the rest were broken down not even a mechanical could save the bunch with him because from that, he sprinted uphill straight back to them in the space of half a kilometre. We are running out of superlatives. Only time will tell us this, but we're looking at a candidate there for the best bike rider that's ever existed. It's just a pure joy to watch the way he races because he doesn't wait for others. He's really an exciting rider to watch. He's a great guy off the bike as well. You can see he's a brilliant uh, person to have within the team. He's 
personality. He's just an all-round great human being. And sometimes you see that he is human, where you think, oh, he's this... He, he, nothing can, can stop him. We do see him have some days where it just doesn't quite, you know, have it. But for, for Pogaccia, it's, it's just a pure joy. Pure joy. Well, we will add that it isn't done and dusted yet. We know that. It certainly looks like it should be on any normal day, the way he's riding. I'm just going to add one little question here. Did he get the drink that he was after all that time ago? Has he eaten properly? The thing is, we've seen that before from some of the most experienced riders in the peloton where they've forgotten to eat and drink. And they're fine, they're fine, and then 10 kilometers to go, the lights go out, they've blown, and they cannot respond to anything, they can't continue the effort or the pace in which they've been going at for the, the past 150 kilometers. And it seems like the most simplest of things to do to make sure that you eat and drink it's, it's what you learn when you're a an under 14 and under 16 a in your junior years to make sure that you're eating and, and drinking and with so much focus and emphasis within teams of their nutritionists and making sure that the, the, the riders are fueling and hydrating themselves well it is something that sports directors still have to go on the radio and say make sure you're eating make sure you're drinking take a gel You've seen already so many of the soigneurs dotted across the course. Some of the soigneurs doing three, four feed zones because of the nature of the course where you can cross and traverse your way across the Limburg countryside. But that is the question, making sure that you, you aren't depleting your stores. Especially when the weather's cold, you're burning a lot more energy to try and keep the, the, the body uh, the temperature at a good level. Similarly, if you've got too many clothes on and your core body temperature starts to rise, you're also eating a lot more energy to try and cool that core body temperature. One minute and 47 to this group. Time gap slightly different, and you'd say, well, they have a great chance because they're working really well together. But they're still a minute behind the next group on the road. Gacha has just extended his gap by another second. Bit by bit, he's just eking it out. 22.8 kilometers to go. Our next climb will be the Kalberg. It will be the final passage up the Kalberg. After that, we'll head down to the Hölhemerberg again. And then the Bemlerberg will be the last climb of the day. 16 seconds the arrears for Tom Pitcock. Once second before already on a photo finish that we still can't make sense of. Wout van Aert was the winner on that day. And Ben Healy here is having the spring of his lifetime. Racing through the Dutch countryside as finally the roads start to dry up. 22 kilometers remain. Any normal day, any other rider up front, you'd be saying, well, they work together, you never know, they might bring it back. Tadej Bogacá is out in front. And when that happens, we normally know the result. But they will keep riding. They have to believe. It's one of those points where anything could happen. Not t trying to tempt fate or anything, but anything could happen in this next 21 kilometers. Whether that be puncture, whether that be a different mechanical, you never quite know. And I think you can never stop believing at this point in, in the race, knowing that it's still striking distance. Pickcock, you can see, he's still got something left in the legs. You can see with the, the accelerations that he's making, the work that he's doing here with Ben Healy. The moment. Another gel acquired by Tade Bogacha. Leader of the race on the left-hand side, the closest chasers on the right. Bogacha in the black and white, wearing 51. It's only the second time he's ever appeared at the start list of the Amstel Cold Race. He came this morning saying that this was even more technical than the Tour of Flanders, which he won it just the second time of asking a couple of weeks ago. 
His only previous appearance here was in his debut year, and he didn't even finish. Well, the legend has developed since then. The winds have been totted up. And the way it's looking here, there'll be another one to add to that W column. Only four riders previously have ever won the Tour de France and the Amstel Gold Race. Today, Pogacar on his way into a club of five. Unless Ben Healy here, Irish rider from EF Education Easy Post, or the British rider, Tom Pitcock, can deny him. Their problem is they've been riding well, they've been riding strongly, committing equally, but they're losing seconds. They're 21 seconds behind now, whereas this couple of riders, this pair, is now at one minute and two. The biggest group, with all the numbers and power they have, they're at two minutes, and this man alone puts out the power, piles on the seconds, and increases his lead. It's like he just decided to move the finish line to where he wanted. The race started at, for him with over 100 kilometers to go, filtering into that move of 16 riders then. And then that attack at just under 30 k's to go. Not everybody able to hold the wheel. On the road now to Falkenberg for the second and final time today. Three climbs to go. And the second and final ascent of the Karlberg is now on us. A champion's reception. A new name, a new nation that could well be added to the honours list at the Amstel Gold Race. The Slovenian sensation, Tadej Pogacar. In a day where we've already seen the greatest rider this sport's ever seen racing early on with Mariana Foss. Now a contender to take her title in a few years. He's up the road, they can't quite see him yet. This pair just has to keep riding, Hannah. They have to believe, they have to hope that Pog runs out of power. At, at some point, they, they have to keep the hope alive. They can't be discouraged in the fact that they can't see him up the road ahead on the Cowberg here. But you can still see that that will, that fight, that want is still there from both Healy and Pidcock here. Even just the way that they were riding into the lower part of the Cowberg then, rounding that left-hand turn. Pitcock here on the pedals, and again, looking good. It's been a return to form for him today. And it looks good with the week coming up, doesn't it? I mean, what looks pretty ominous for everyone else in the week coming up is this man alone, again, at the front. What a way to start the, the trilogy of the Ardennes. Amstel today at the gates to the Ardennes. We moved to the Ardennes proper on Wednesday with the Flesh Wallon or the Walser Pale, the meaning which of the Belgian languages you speak. And then next Sunday, Liege past on your Liege, Lurk, Bastenach and Lurk. The Doyen. Just under 18 kilometers remain, but as a contest, this looks done, this looks dusted. It's that word, it's belief. You have to have it, because we know this is sport, this is life, this is bike racing. Doesn't always go to plan. Bogacic already had an issue or two today that will be on his control. He's recovered from them sensationally. And proved that if he does, as we think he will win, he will be very much the worthy winner. But again, everybody has to believe. Look at this, it's a two minute 16 gap for this group at the bottom of the carpet. No watch on today, he's riding into his own time. Go on, go on, go on, go on. 
33 seconds. Over half a minute now for Tadej Pogacar. Now coming up here, when he next sees the little bit of road just beyond that little dip, and if he's still out in front, he'll be on his way to take the victory. So 800 metres here. Behind. Well, they'll know the score, won't they? Disappointingly, yes. They'll know what's going on up ahead the of, uh, of the race, known that that time gap, despite the riding, and we've not had too much of a glance or a view as to how that group behind has been working in the last five, ten kilometres. It's not without want or need or they've been uh, that they've been riding there's still that impetus within the group but it's just the strength of the numbers up ahead and the strength of the riders up ahead and Bacaccia still continuing to to open things up to Tom Pidcock and Ben Healy he knows there's another lap to go here doesn't he I hope so because <laughs> the way he was looking just then <laughs> last lap for today Pogacar it's been Pog Power yet again. The bell rings in Limburg in the Netherlands. And a man, already a legend, rides past knowing that bizarre incidents or accidents are the only things that will get in the way of another victory. He's on his way to the Hulemerberg here, then the Bimlerberg, and then the grand finale. And it's going to be nigh on 30 seconds for Tadej Pogacar as a lead. The bell rings for the next to cross the line. Just over 30 seconds. Pitcock and Healy passed them. This race has been blown to smithereens by Tadej Pogacar, just as he did two weeks ago in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. He's turned up and he's about to conquer. The camera angle there just foreshortening it. What I thought was that Kron and Lutsenko coming back and closing the gap to Pitcock and Healy. It's been a mighty fight for this duo trying to bridge their way back home when you think they've gone from being five seconds in arrears on the on the climb on the Kirkenberg to then now just over well over a minute and a ten seconds. It's gonna end up being a minute and sixteen. It's incredible in the last 10 kilometers how these gaps have opened up. The one that surprises me most is the gap from this group to the next group. And still with with riders, you, you look at Tish Benut in that, that group behind who they they were in such a strong position position, Jumbo Visma, Maxime Van Gill's in that group. It's uh Genie is in that group from F uh, Group Armour FDJ, but of course he's been in that breakaway. He was one of the riders, the final rider from Group Armour FDJ to be to be dropped. Zangler and tricked. So there's a lot of tired legs. Schellemos are just coming through for Trek Segafredo still in this group, but mighty ride from Alex Camp, the Danish champion from Tudor Pro Cycling. Jai Hindley was was looking good when he started to make a few moves here and there earlier on on the climbs, but just for the fact that the group never made contact at all with that breakaway. I think also with that crash, it certainly changed the dynamic of the way that the race perhaps could could have turned out as well. All that impetus gone out of the chase. Two and a half minutes, and it has gone. As Pogacar is now on the penultimate climb already. It was a funny moment, he did come through the line then. It almost looked like he thought it was the end. I hope they told him there was another lap. <laughs> you hope he's been eating and drinking. But he's smiling away here as he rides away. 32 seconds for the rider from UAE Emirates. And this is the Hurl Emmerberg for the final time. 1.1 kilometers long. Almost 6% average with that 8% maximum. And there's the right turn off the top and the back roads. And it takes them to the Bemleberg for the final time. He's already had a bike change, remember? 
bottom of that climb, almost 300 metres further down the road, Pitcock and Healy, and Healy's going to go. Look at this, trying to drop Pitcock. Ben Healy. Well, it's not really getting rid of the Brit just yet, but you really have to look at his attacking nature. But Pitcock is labouring to try and get onto the back wheel of Healy there. There That's we go. Not being there an we easy... go. Wow. That's not been an easy ride back on there for Pitcock, and he's starting to crack. The head has dropped. Ben Healy. Absolutely brilliant. And this is the ride of Healy's career. Yes, I know he was fighting it up for the win on Wednesday, and he's had wins this year. The former Irish champion, though, is absolutely flying. And one of the best all-round bikers that the sport has ever seen has just been ridden off the wheel. Olympic mountain bike champion, former world cyclocross champion, a winner of the race that Healy came second in the other day. Tom Pitcock ridden off the wheel. And the gap, the way that that's opened up within 100, 150 metres there of Healy just breaking Pitcock, it shows that... <laughs> unbelievable. And um Healy is a tremendous time trialist as well. He's putting himself in a position, if the unthinkable was to happen out in front, that he would be there and the next man on the road. Great ride, Ben Healy. What a, a real advancement to the front of the pack. The spring of his life, and he's on his way to a podium. Gap down for the first time in a while. Now then, well, what is Pogaccia being told about this? We have quite the history in the last few years of quite interesting and exciting finishes here. And it's also interesting because with only one climb remaining in the Bamelberg, only um, a few hundred metres of, of a climb, it's a steep one, but the gap, if it starts to come down considerably, if you think, Rob, to, to the final few kilometres where you're onto the narrow lanes where a little bit of flat road, it's a little bit undulating, but there's no real climb there, and then you've got that flat one kilometre to the finish line, if he can continue to eat away the gap of Pogaccia here, Healy, now he's got the bit between his teeth, he's got that motivation, knowing that he's been able to drop Pidcock, and now the gap, 23 seconds it just appeared at there. Wow. He can't, can he? The nerves start to fray. Tadej Pogaccia with a 21 second lead now. He had over 30 seconds. He will be being told now that it's time to ride for his life again. Because Ben Healy's in the chase. He's a solid rider against the clock. He was really strong there on the climb. And Pogaccio will not want to play around with this lead in this race that has this history of quite the exciting finish in recent years. So Pogaccio on the back roads. This is one of the differences now in, in the parkour this year. It's really exposed as well. And this is where the wind is coming onto the right-hand shoulder of the riders. This is where it's starting to pick up. And Healy, you can see from the difference, the speed of these two riders side by side in this picture and picture now that Pogaccio I wonder if he is starting to tire. I wonder if the the kilometers that he went without a feed, without being able to get a bottle from a Swanier from the team car, is that starting to affect him? Is this just Healy on an absolute stellar day? 23 seconds. Keep your eye on that time gap. And here's Pitcock in the meantime. No threat to his other podium position just yet. But Healy is completely out of sight. Is he going to have Pogaccio in his own sight soon? Ten kilometers to go. It looked done as a contest. And now Pogaccio sees the race car move in front of him. On his way to the Bimleberg. It's flashing south by another couple of seconds. 
now just below 20. Has Pogaccia been eating and drinking? Are those legs empty? A look behind. Now then, that's a nervous sign, Anna Walker. He's getting worried now. He's certainly getting worried. He'll be having these time checks given to him through that race radio from the sports director behind and knowing that Healy is on the chase. And also where it's quite open and exposed, Healy will, will have been able to see Pogaccia there on the left-hand side where he's made that left-hand turn. He'll see him up ahead. They've got a long straight road to come now so that Healy is like, he's got that character chase. He's got that rider up ahead, and he knows that if he's on a good day, he's got that confidence. He's got Pikachu up the road, and he's the rider who's closing in the time gap here. Does he have him on the ropes, though? Just gone out again ever so slightly. The gap, by the way, to Pogaccio staying st to uh, Pidcock is staying stable. Pogaccio looks around again. He's aware. He knows. Something is afoot. Is something amiss at the front? That's the question. Or is it just that awareness? You also wonder if it's that, those anxious thoughts as we head towards the Bamelberg for the final time. If you are starting to feel it, if you are starting to feel the fatigue, if you are starting to hunger flat, that it's another difficult climb. It's just that sting in the tail, another bite to, to contend with. I think once he gets over the top of that, then perhaps he'll start to feel a little bit more confident, a little bit more comfortable. And with the quick succession in which Keeley has been able to close the time gap, and the sports directors will have seen as well the ferocious attack that he's made in order to drop Tom Pickcock. And they'll be relaying this, that, Pick, that Healy's coming across, he's looking strong. Brace yourself. Well, for Pogaccia, the time gap is telling him a little more positive story right now. He's managed to put another three or four seconds back into Ben Healy. Translates to about 320 metres on the road at the minute. Whereas Healy has almost 400 metres to Pitcock. Here is Ben Healy now. And here's the look forward. It's telling us 27 seconds. Now his Healy started to pay for that effort. <laughs> it's a wonderfully entertaining tug of war, this. And now he's heading to the bottom of the Bimleberg. The final climb, the final classified climb in this Amsel Gold race. Because after the Bimleberg, they will take on undulating roads that were introduced in this particular race to try and foil the plans where anybody wanted to wait for a bunch finish or wait for a final attack. But we have had such exciting racing in the last few years here since that change. The 33rd and final classified climb, and it's to be taken on by the race leader, Tadej Pogaccia, who seems to be surviving a panic and rebuilding his lead over Ben Healy. This is a 900 meter long climb. It should be right up Pogaccia Street, this. Regains his rhythm, rides away, and yet again it says he has half a minute. If you ever thought that perhaps he was riding on complacency, well, that was a little wake-up call that Healy was on his way, and Healy onto the lower slopes of the Bamelberg now. Same 31 seconds. Perhaps a handful of seconds shorter than that. Yeah, there might be a few people looking out the front as well and seeing the leading car sitting maybe rather close to Tadej Pogacar there. I understand it's just cleared off out of vision now, but it's a little strange on those narrow roads. And now Pogacar has the open road in front of him. The gap has gone up since that was noted. 35 seconds now. And I think uh, much will be said about that lead car. We know that the decision was already made on the climbs, wasn't it? This is the final climb. Ben Healy, whatever happens today, all this applause is for you. A fighter a racer, a real powerhouse. 
And here comes Tom Pitcock. A return to form for him today. Looks as though he's on and heading for his second Amstel Gold Race podium. And you can just hear that. Come on, podium is the shout. But he might have a little bit of competition behind. Alexei Lutsenko and Andreas Kron working hard. And at the front, Tadej Pogacar with 40 seconds of a gap now. Another scandalously good ride from Tadej Pogacar. We really are running out of superlatives. Approaching the final five kilometers now. And the gap to Healy really does look like it has increased. He gave it a go at the right minute, but he's clearly suffering here now, Hannah. He is, but I think it was one of those opportunities in the race where he could feel that Pidcock was really starting to suffer. He knew that that was his moment to try and break the British rider. And that car into that gap tells you that really is enough now. UAE car up to be able to celebrate, I think, with Tadej Pogacar. For Healy as well, it was, you have to try in this race. We've seen it before that take your opportunity to, to try something. And we've seen already that when that time gap came to 19 seconds, 20 seconds, that whilst we thought, well, it's a dead set, that's it, Pogacar's going to win, I'm still gold. It was that moment well perhaps the, the the race isn't going in the direction that we might have thought 10 10 kilometers ago he knows the smiles there 43 seconds ben healy will also have his team car joining him any moment now it have overtaken pitcock again won't be able to feed from the car, but you can certainly have that motivation from behind. Helping and egging him on for the final five kilometers. Yep, the 20 kilometer rule means no more feeding here. Tadej Pogacar is on his way now. To a very special moment. Had a top 10 before with Mate Mohoric, but nothing ever better, Slovenia. Just for the numbers, it's going to be win number 57 in Tadej Pogacar's short career. At 24 years of age, he will be in the top 10 youngest winners of this race ever. Not quite as young as Henrik Nettemann, when he won in 1974 at the age of 23. Ben Healy. Rider 22, who is making his way in the sport. There will be a lot of team bosses sitting up and looking at maybe where he might be riding next season, eh? Absolutely, and especially teams who might not have had seasons that they, they would have hoped for so far. And it is the the time as well. You, you see already teams start to to search for and look out for riders earlier and earlier in the season contracts getting signed earlier on and for Healy when you take a look at the consistency and the way in which he's able to deliver consistent results and the potential is there and you're, still only 22 years of old it's uh, years of age if you're Jonathan Vorters you're signing him up to a new deal now aren't you after this last few weeks you, wow. you have to you have to at this point if you see the progression in which he's made only in his second year as a professional then now's the time secure him before it's too late just over half a kilometer for today Pogacar and we know this has been a done deal for a while there was that moment of nerves and and again questions will be asked about that car right in front of Pogacar right at the moment that he re-extended his lead again it, it was very very close very close indeed um it was It's not necessary for it to be so close at all. It shouldn't be there. Coincidence or not, it will be a topic of discussion. 
quite rightly so. But here we go, we're just over two kilometres to go. And now Bogaccia can almost be ready to celebrate. As she does our supporters group have to endure another weekend when they don't really turn up for business in the big races. Disappointed because they did have Cousinofroy out there, and of course they'll be worried about the health of Dorian Godon, who had that very nasty crash. Greg Van Athemart was there. He was still represented into the real thick of the action. There's several teams, though, who have really and severely missed out here. They've never really had themselves in the game. They've never had a rider who's been in a position where they've been on the front foot. You look at Border Hounds Grower, always on the back foot chasing. Barry and Victoria is always on the back foot chasing. Jumbo Fismo were in a OK position with Tosh van der Sander, but when he dropped back to help Tish Benut and Sam Oman, again, a team who have gone from having such strength, but no one able to challenge Tade Pagacha. Already 10 victories this season before he started today. And Tade Pogaccia is now on that narrow road, the famous road. We saw it all happen a few years ago. He's on his way to the final kilometre and a half. 40 seconds ahead of Ben Healy. In the lead. Having been part of an attacking group of 16 riders with over 100 kilometres still remaining. It's not just the fact he does it often, it's the way he does it. The manner in which he wins. Tadej Pogacar with one kilometre to go until his latest masterpiece. Behind Ben Healy has been a contributing artist. His brush strokes, not quite as finessed and fine, but certainly ones that people will admire for quite a while to come. Here's the man who's going to take the win. Road open ahead. A look behind and he won't see anybody yet. Tuft of hair popping out the helmet. He knew he was on form when that was going to happen. And there's nobody there yet again. Tadej Pogacar thanks his team, but in all honesty, he was out there alone with over 100 kilometers to go. 15 other riders from other teams were with him. One by one, he rode them off the wheel. Not even a mechanical problem got in the way. Tadej Pogacar, the first time back at this race in four years, but six hours of attritional, aggressive racing, and yet again, he has done it. The Amstel Gold Race added to a long list of rides that will go down in the history books. He came, he conquered. Tadej Pogacar becomes just the fifth rider in history who's won the Tour de France to win the Amstel Gold Race. And he does it in sensational style. Rim at 42 kilometers per hour, six hours in the saddle. All the glory, all the power to go to Pog. But commitment, celebration, and enjoyment behind too. Because Ben Healy's going to pull off a brilliant second place. A heroic ride from Healy. He acknowledges his fans. His stock is rising. What a spring the Irishman's having. He'll join Pogacar on the podium. So wrong. So nice. <laughs> what happened? You, you have, uh, flat and another one is ticked off. There's the congratulations between them. Congratulations, eh? Thank you. Are oh, they even there impressed with that ride? Maro Gennetti noticing the tremendous ride from Ben Healy there. What a performance. And behind, Pitcock might have company in the fight for the podium. Lutsenko is alongside Kron. Pitcock, who was dropped in a difficult place, ridden off the wheel by Pogacar and then by Healy, has half a kilometre to hang on for a second podium here in the Amstel Gold Race. But they will wait behind, they will look at each other. Are they going to leave it too late? Pitcock rides away. The tank is almost empty. 
and he can see that finish line, but they're messing about too much behind, I think. Surely this now has to go to Pitcock. 300 meters, maybe one dot, one burst from behind can do it. There is Crom that's gonna launch the sprint. What does Pitcock have left? It's the final bit of excitement as we look to the podium. Oh, he is powerless to do anything about this here, Pitcock. Fading all the way to the line. Can he hang on? 25 meters out ahead. Third place on the podium, just about goes to Pitcock. Then it's Crom, then it's Lutsenko. There's the top five on the day. But if there had been cohesion, Hannah, they would have had him. If they had just committed to that and shared that workload, if Kron didn't shake their head and say, I don't want to come through, if Lutsenko didn't do the same, the podium could be very, very different. And it's a surprise when you think you've been chasing for oh so long, you have the podium almost in grasp. But this man, what a performance every time he steps on the bike, every time he's in the peloton. Racing for sixth place here in one of the many small punches about to come across the line. Maxime Bochils, he's leading out the sprint there. The Mish, hoping for a, one of those big results as well. Camp is there for Tudor Pro Cycling. Top 10 on their debut would be good here. And we'll get that top 10. Sudal quick step and win the battle there for the sixth place with Andrea Bacioli. But the racing had already happened. These are all riders that were at the game a long, long time ago. Movi Star almost anonymous today. And this is the opportunity for Simon Gott to try and race to the line with a Dutch champion, but this time in very different circumstances. No point there. And here's Golden Greg. Next to those finishes, and he will sprint for every place. Left inside of the picture. With the centre, though, it's the runner from Total Energy who is going to take it. Castle in ruins down in Falkenberg and well, Peloton in the same state when the Tadej Pogacar decided to attack them. There wasn't much left. The only difference is Pogacar still so young, this ruin still so old. And there could Tadej be a Pogacar, few more of those two weeks Here ago, is. Tour of Flanders, now the Amsterdam Gold Race. Every victory has his own story. What's today's story? Yeah, it's unbelievable today, actually. I did not expect that we go in breakaway so early. And uh, yeah, I was on a sort of flat tire for for many cases in the front. And yeah, uh, I was doubting that I could uh, I could come to the finish solo. But uh, in the end, yeah, I squeezed as much as possible to come to the finish line. And uh, yeah, I made it. That's the Amstel Gold Race, huh? the, 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 the narrow roads. It's difficult for your sports director to reach you. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I was really frustrated because we didn't have cars for so long time. And uh, yeah, then uh, we managed to get the bike uh, just in time to before the final climbs. And uh, yeah, it was really, really tight and uh, really nervous at, the, at one moment. <laughs> The first attack when you rode away with the big group, around 80 kilometers to go, was that according to plan? No, no. Uh, I just, I just went to the front. I saw some uh, really, uh, really good riders in that group, and uh, yeah, many, many riders. So uh, I, uh, I jumped to the front. Our guys could sit in the back and control. So yeah, either way, if, uh, either way, we were in good situation because we had. In the, bed, in, uh, in the back, Hirschi and Trentin, but I think they had uh, some bad luck in the end. The decisive uh, attack was on uh, the Keuterberg. This week you told us that you don't know the names of the climbs, but you know that it was steep enough to go? Oh, Matthew van der Poel told me that I should go on Keuterberg, and uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, it, it is the most hard climb, and uh, most uh, it suits, suits me the most. When did he tell you uh, that? 
When did he tell you? Uh, three days ago. Okay. Yeah. He sent you a message or did he ring you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. send me a message. Yeah. And you sent him a message back right now or? Yeah, of course. I will. Uh, I will thank him for advice. <laughs> Next up, flash ballon and then Liège. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Wednesday is. Uh, it's a flash. Um, I, it's hard race for me. I never uh, did a good result there. Uh, but uh, yeah, with good shape right now, I think in a uh, good team, we can do a great result also in flash. Thank you very much. Good shape is an understatement. Bjorn Aris, Jupp Zoltemelk, Ben Arino, Eddie Merckx and now Tadej Pogacar, winners of the Tour to win the Amstel Gold Race. Tadej Pogacar beating Ben Healy, Tom Pitcock, Kron, Lutsenko, Bajoli van Gils, Skilmorza, Kamp and Zangler. But in all honesty, nobody was in his league. Pogacar going on the Kottenberg, but in all honesty, the race launched with more than 100 kilometers to go. Pogacar in his typical style, bringing his brand of exciting attacking racing to the Netherlands. An interesting fact revealed there that he'd been talking to a big rival of his who obviously gets on with rather well because this is where Mathieu Fodder pulled all into attack. <laughs> well, the management and sports directors at Alperton de Koenig will be saying to the riders, no, you can't say to the riders where to attack, where to make your move. He's well, gonna... he kept to it. He took the advice, he did it, it worked, he broke Pidcock, he broke uh, Healy. They don't call it the calf biter for no reason. The youngest age, by the way, for a podium on a classic this season. 23, the average age. For once, Pogacar, the, the oldest one of the lot there. That can't have happened very often. Not this man's come along and made it a young man's game now, hasn't he? He has, and we've seen over the last three, four years how things have changed. I think perhaps we've only really noticed it with Tade Pogacar, but you think back the year previous, Egon Bernal winning the Tour so young. It's always been in perhaps the, the last six years that the, the riders who are winning and, and serial winners are becoming younger and younger. And for the older generation, the way that the racing has changed, the way that the dynamic has changed, well, few and far between for some riders. For some who were previously serial winners, it's three, four years since they've been able to have their hands in the air. Pogacar already 11 victories to his name just in 2023 alone. And this is another one ticked off, and you sort of get the feeling with him that he's got like this bucket list, and he's just going around putting ticks next to him. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me. Almost just creating his own script, creating his own history. And the huge, enormous victories he's had so far in so many of the monuments and the, the big, big races. Some would only dream to win one of those. And this is the damage he's done. Depleted, disintegrated. Some tired legs and bodies out there. Brian Kukar in the middle of this group as well, we haven't seen all day. Sam Molman who was up the front, working hard. He was scaling your attack, Trentin, he'll be happy. He'll be celebrating again. He did an important job in there, did Matteo Trentin. He, he put himself in a position, if Pagaccia needed him when he had that, that slow, flat tyre, he put himself in a position with Ida Schelling that if Pagaccia needed Trentin, he could have given him his bike, he could have given him his wheel, because still, for it must have been 10, 20 kilometres, if not more, the gap was never big enough for the team car to come into that gap. There was never the, the possibility or ability to have a assistance from the team car to have a new bike or a, a new wheel the way things played out really such into the fortune and favor of Pogaccia in the end and he was looking like well this is it this is the breakaway done and dusted we haven't seen it in all its glory today Limburg have we but we've certainly seen a very very special result can see that the 
the socials already gone crazy with the the car incident. But that's to be expected with anything that happens on the road at the minute. But yes, there will be quite rightfully questions asked about that. Of course, we hope that everybody in the crash is OK as well, because that looked a nasty one on those white lines and in the wet, didn't it? But while we wait for the podium here, a chance to have a quick look around. And again, not just the, the doom and gloom and the weather, but the racing was so enthralling that we didn't really get a chance to have a look elsewhere, did we? Our eyes were very much on Pog powering away again. And not for the first time. And I don't think it'll be the last time for the season. It's something so majestic about the way that he races, the way that he rides with such calm, cool collectiveness about him. No matter what, anything, whatever is, is thrown at him, whether that be a, a long mechanical where a lot of riders, they, they might start to lose their head, they might start to get frustrated saying, I need the team car behind me, I need a change, I need a new bike. It's don't let anybody else really know that you've got the problem. Nobody was looking at Pikachu thinking, well, he's got a problem here, he's got a mechanical, you know, is this him going to be out of this group? Is this our opportunity to to beat the Slovenian? It's the relaxed nature of of Bogaccia. He certainly has a way with dealing with everybody in the press. Even the little anecdote there about Matthias van der Poel. And the advice that he gave him. One that will certainly attract plenty of attention. All the attention will be on the podium because this will be an historic moment. Yes, I know for the home crowd it isn't quite 2019. It isn't Mathieu van der Poel winning in the way he won. There was no football crowd cheer, but there's certainly appreciation of what they've seen, which is something rather special. I think as well with with any cycling fans or, or fans of sport, and you see the way in which Pogaccio is, is so successful, the way that he's such an advocate for the sport and brings so much excitement. I don't think it matters which nation you're from, you can just appreciate the sheer level of of talent and amazement in the way that he races. And it's also special for for the Dutch and for the race to have someone of, of Pogaccia's prestige. All eyes on the podium as we await the stars who will occupy it. And here they come. There is Ben Healy. Cleaned up and ready to go. A big moment for him. Again, he has won races this year. But this is a completely different thing, isn't it? He's surrounded by... Pidcock just behind him on the podium, Olympic champion in the mountain bike, former world champion on the cross field, a winner of one day races, here he is. And just ahead of him, a candidate for the greatest cyclist of all time, if he continues at this rhythm. I think especially when you look further down into the top ten, Grand Tour stage winners, Tour de France winners, the Tour de France stage winners. Only a winner four times in his career. In Italy this year, in Coppi Bartali and uh, in Nanciano. A national champion in the time trial. And a national champion in the road race, even before he turned pro. But then again, no Palmares will really impress this man yet. Although apparently he's, he's quite into the history of the race. I heard a nice story this week that he, he met Walter Plankert, oh. former winner of the Tour of Flanders in a race. And Walter has his own team. Of course, he... Uh, Runs Flanders Barbois, and he asked him for a selfie. And apparently Walter was absolutely delighted. He's like, Pogaccia. Walter, 75, been asked for a selfie by Pogaccia. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. 
Okay. He has such respect also for the history of many, many races, isn't he? I think it's just that it's uh, never ceases to amaze me. All these little anecdotes. Already for the podium ceremony. And the moment that Tadej Pogacar officially celebrates yet another of those big races being added to his ever growing palmares. Tom Pitcock in third. So he's had second, third, just waiting for that first now for Pitcock in this race. A race that does seem made for him. Ben Healy, no wonder he's all smiles. British born, representing the country of his mother's birth. The Irishman. Great to see an Irish rider up there in the classics again. Great history they have in the discipline. And here he is, yet again. He's brought his own style of magic to a different race. And four years after his only other appearance ended in a non-finish, today the headlines are all his. And he's got the rather jazzy podium ceremony. You reckon he can hold it for 10 seconds? <laughs> he's ready, he's waiting. He was ready 100 kilometers ago when he attacked. Tadej Pogacar on the podium and winning the Amstel Gold Race. First time he ever finishes the race, he finishes first. From the Ronde of Vlaanderen to the Amstel Gold. Next destination, the Ardennes. Where will the Tadej Pogacar show end up next? Cheers. <laughs> and it was thirsty work, wasn't it? <laughs> he didn't get the bead on. There we go, Good he gets man. the cheer for the crowd. He knows that that's what they want in this part of the world. On the bike and off it. Pogacha, perfect. A tremendous podium at the end of a tremendous race. Today Pogacha wins it. Healy second, Pitcock third. Pog, the man in Amsterdam. First impressed about the race. Secondly, impressed that he necked that beer. <laughs> the only riders managed to do that so far today. <laughs> Again, he was looking for a bead on for the last few kilometers, wasn't he? He's looking ever so slightly depleted at one point. Went through a bit of a rough patch, I would say. You could already see it, but then second wave came through and this will be the most aggressive rider prize because simply he was and the Hermann Krug trophy I mentioned earlier in the broadcast one a few years ago by Ida Skelling also goes to Tadej Pogacar who takes all the prizes Well, Pogaccia waves goodbye to the crowd that willed him on. 
They won't be celebrating a Dutch victory today, but they will be knowing that they were there on the day that Tadej Pogacar turned up and did what he did in the Amstel Gold Race. And I think we're about to see. What a day it's been. Two brilliant races, fantastic finishes, and adventurous action at the front from Tadej Pogacar there to take a win on just the second time of asking. Four years after he failed to finish the Amstel Gold Race. Wherever you've been watching, thanks for joining Hannah Walker and me, Rob Hatch. We'll see you soon. Goodbye.